This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Good morning. It's three minutes after ten and I have been sitting here for the best part of seven years now, starting the programme on some mornings by suggesting that we have moved into unprecedentedly perilous waters. And here we are again. I've had enough. I don't know about you, but my goodness me what I'd give for a return to days of of polite disagreement. Well, not even polite disagreement, but just disagreement about actual sorts of policies and ideas rather than people trying to tell us what reality is. We now have a government that is trying to introduce the notion of a vote in Parliament changing observable reality. So Rwanda is not a safe country. That is the finding of the United Kingdom's Supreme Court. But Rishi Sunak thinks if he can just get all of his uh, lickspittal MPs to vote in a certain way, then they can make it safe. I, if I were Rishi Sunak, I wouldn't stop there. I'd introduce a motion designed to uh, state, not claim, state that England has won every World Cup since 1930. I would introduce a motion designed to state that it is going to be uh, lovely weather, but there's going to be snow on Christmas Day and sunshine on Boxing Day. We could introduce a motion, we could have a vote in Parliament on whether or not... Morecambe and Wise is the finest comedy programme of all time. Actually, that's probably the least controversial thing that I've said. Oh, how about the Earth is flat? We could have a vote on the Earth being flat and the COVID vaccines being sort of secret microchips that allow Bill Gates to control when you go to the toilet. All of these things, if you got a parliamentary majority in support of them, they wouldn't suddenly become true. Any more than passing a bill that states that Rwanda is safe would suddenly make Rwanda safe. We spoke this week, this week, to the daughter of a man who was kidnapped by the Rwandan government and tortured in prison within the last three years. In 2018, refugees from the Democratic Republic of Congo were shot dead by Rwandan police for protesting about their food rations. These are facts. These are matters of historical record. These are examples of observable reality. But James Cleverly, who has previously described the Rwanda plan, and I'm going to use a word that's a bit rude, but I've heard it on the BBC at least three times this morning, so if they can do it, then I can do it. I'm just warning you in case you've got kids in the car. James Cleverly, the Foreign Secretary, in successive interviews this morning, was reminded that he once used the word batshit to describe the plan to deport refugees to Rwanda, to transfer refugees to Rwanda. I'll I'll play you a couple of examples. Um, Alan's been in touch already. He says, can you put Scotland down for one of those World Cup wins? It's a fair point, Alan. Uh, Actually, I'll give you three. So Rishi Sunak could pass legislation in the House of Commons that states England has won most of the World Cups since 1930, but Scotland won three of them, and indeed that the earth is flat and the moon is made of cheese. If they got Lee Anderson and enough other brain-dead Tories to vote in Parliament in support of a motion stating that the moon is made of cheese, do you think that the moon would suddenly become cheese at the moment that the Speaker or the tellers read out the result of the vote? Nose to the left, eyes to the right. Do you think if the eyes to the right had a majority in Parliament, the moon would miraculously become cheese? I I suppose that if you've got gammon between your ears, there's a possibility that you think it would. But who else is this sort of politics designed to appeal to? Who else? I'm not going to use that word a lot. I will use it probably once or twice more. I'm very uncomfortable. Do you know, if you ever meet me off air, I swear like a trooper. I've got such a potty mouth. I've got a little bit better I've got as I've got older, partly because I try not to do it in front of the children. But I've got such a miracle I've never sworn on air. It keeps Keith on his toes, keeps him sort of uh, alert, keeps him awake, actually, I think, some mornings. But I've never, ever done, I've never even come close, really. Well, that's not true, is it? There have been a couple of occasions when, for example, talking about the uh, water companies pumping shocking amounts of sewage into the... uh, into the rivers of these islands, um, all that kind of stuff. Could vote to pass legislation for 26 hours in a day so that the clocks really could strike 13. It's a rather neat, unsigned contribution, drawing upon the work of George Orwell. Um, 
And Ian points out, once again, didn't you say something kind of nice about the Home Secretary yesterday, and now he's speaking pure nonsense? Uh, can you please keep your opinions to yourself in future to stop jinxing them? He's walking around the place, having previously described the plan he's now defending as batshit, claiming essentially that the appeal court ru- ruling came in 15 months ago. When, unless, unless they have passed legislation in Parliament to, to make a month 60 days long, 90 days long, I think you'll find it came in five months ago. So he says that we've been working for 15 months since the appeal judgment came in. The appeal court ruled on this to put together a treaty with Rwanda. But the appeal court judgment came in five months ago. Do you think he's misread something on a piece of paper in front of him? Do you think it's a typo? Do you think a little bit of hair fell out of his nose and it looks like a one on the piece of paper? So he thinks it was 15 months ago when actually it was five months ago. I do not know. I do not know. Tilly's not happy in Whitby. She says... um, the moon is made of cheese. That's a dis- that is a disgrace. So that's all well and Liz Trust getting a nod from the text so far. And not for the first time, I find myself wondering what to, how to approach this topic with you without giving some weight to the idea that the moon is made of cheese, that Parliament can render a country safe simply by voting to describe it as safe. That's what we've been brought to. I think we might do a Marvin Gaye day. Do you fancy a Marvin Gaye day? Should we have a Marvin Gaye day? A what's going on day? There are so many questions here. How do they get away with it? Who are they hoping to appeal to? Why are they putting so much weight on this ludicrous plan described by the man now charged with delivering it as B-A-T-S-H-I-T? It is just utterly baffling. So I'll tell you what I think is going on and you can then tell me what you think is going on. And it may be the same as what I think is going on or it may be something different from what I think is going on. And as ever, I appreciate this is becoming an increasingly plaintive cry. If you love the idea... Oh, oh, there was some interesting research on Peston last night that chimed completely with something that I told you yesterday. Significant portion of the electorate still don't actually know what the so-called Rwanda plan is. And, and I, I mean, I, I worried I might be exaggerating, but two thirds of the British public still think, as Ian Duncan Smith was claiming in broadcast studios until relatively recently, they still think that if your claim is successful, although processed in Rwanda, you then return to the United Kingdom to live as uh, not an asylum seeker, but, but um, a, 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 a beneficiary of asylum, to live as a refugee. Um, So there it is. There it is. The public still don't know what it is. Conservative politicians haven't got a clue what it is. People like 30p Lee Anderson are calling for uh, uh, an abandonment of the rule of law. Again, I can't believe these words are coming out of my mouth. It's 11 minutes after 10. The deputy chairman of the Conservative Party wants the rule of law to be abandoned by the Conservative Party, by the Conservative government, by the United Kingdom, the rule of law, bye-bye, down with that sort of thing. And we're all sitting here still talking as if this is just another chapter in the great pageant of British politics. There's still a, 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 a sense that we're still we're, we're, we're normal service. I, I, everything is so ridiculously broken that a deputy chairman of the Conservative Party can call for the suspension of the rule of law and the prime minister can prepare to argue essentially that if you vote that the moon is made of cheese then securing a majority will render the moon cheese and i i'm almost lost for words today because as i turn to newspapers and turn on some broadcasts they're still talking about it as if this is Do you know what I mean? As if it's a sort of, as I say, another chapter in a normal story. It's so utterly abnormal. It's so bonkers and backwards and absurd that I worry journalists don't really have the vocabulary, the professional vocabulary to deal with it. You know, taking what's a chops, Nadine Dorries is absolutely insane conspiracy theory, seriously, because you have to. Someone's been a Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport. You can't put them in the metaphorical loony bin. You have to sort of take what they say seriously. Boris Johnson, as a former Prime Minister, people are still reporting what he says, as if the Covid inquiry never happened. 
as if all of the evidence we have of his absolutely awful conduct, his, 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 his preternatural dishonesty, his contempt for Parliament itself. Same people that were reduced to claiming that actually, no, I didn't vote for more money or a stronger economy or cheaper food when I voted for, oh, I said I was voting for all those things in 2016. What I really voted for was the sovereignty of Parliament. And then your hero comes along and defecates all over. The sovereignty of Parliament is held in complete contempt of Parliament, responds to being found in contempt of Parliament by going further into contempt of Parliament. And, and people, I mean, the Daily Mail give him a column and people still talk about this as if it is in any way normal. It's absolutely batshit. That's what it is. And that's the final time I'm going to use that word. 13 minutes after 10 is the time. They've just passed a motion in Parliament stating that Rishi Sunak is six foot six, apparently. So next time you see him, remember to look up. I don't get it. I, I, I actually don't get it. I think I get it. But it doesn't really work as a, as a full explanation. But I'll tell you what my explanation is. This makes the prorogation of Parliament look like a cakewalk in some ways. Although Andrew points out this is Sunak's pro proroguing moment. I think he's done a Johnson. I hope he's done a Johnson. I think that what Rishi Sunak did yesterday was designed to turn down the volume of people like Suella Braverman and even 30p Lee, who remains deputy leader of the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, despite yesterday endorsing criminality, calling for the cessation of the rule of law, saying just ignore the laws. Think about those words. Ignore the laws. Think about it. You're in a shop. And someone says to you, oh, just ignore the laws. All right, go and fill your boots. Oh, there's a leg of lamb over there. It's got your name on it. Don't worry about paying. Ignore the laws. Someone gets on your nerves. Just go and knock them out. Seriously, ignore the laws. Ignore the laws. Don't like the laws. Ignore the laws. This is sort of, it's not even anarchism. Anarchism's got a kind of philosophical basis. This is just sort of hooliganism masquerading as politics. Thick as mint. Lee Anderson telling you, or rather Rishi Sunak, to ignore the laws. Absolutely unbelievable. So what I think Sunak has done, what I think Sunak has done is just try to turn down the volume. Nobody qualified thinks that any planes are going to be taking off anytime soon. Certainly not this year, almost, well, pretty certainly not next year. But he turns down the volume and hopes that a month from now we're all talking about something else. And that will depend on two things. It will depend upon events, dear boy, events. And it will depend upon noise. It will depend upon how much noise Suella Braverman, with the complicity of some newspapers like the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph, how much noise she can make and how much attention that noise receives. So I have seen reports already that she's got some plan, a grid, I think they've called it, stuff she's going to release, including apparently the document that Rishi Sunak signed promising her that they would indeed um, pass legislation designed to turn the moon into cheese. And it all depends on that. Sunak, I think, is simply hoping it will go away for a while, for long enough. It will lose focus. It will, The spotlight will move on. This is my analysis, and it fits all of the available facts. But it makes Sunak a weak and spineless cipher who is perfectly prepared to flirt with the abandonment of rule of law uh, or, or, or to dress it up as parliamentary shenanigans when in fact it is just hooliganism. It's political violence. It's an assault on our constitution, our unwritten constitution. You should just ignore the laws. Imagine what would have happened if the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party under Margaret Thatcher had told the British public, that it's a good idea to ignore the laws. Imagine under Theresa May uh, that some sort of Neolithic thug could rise to the deputy chairmanship of the Conservative Party and say, ignore the laws. And Sunak is so fenced in and hidebound by the ludicrous inter nissan warfare that the Tory party continues to engage in as much of the country crumbles, more concerned with ambition and promotion and self-advancement than they are with your waiting times at the NHS or with your difficulties getting hold of a house or, or getting a decent house, whatever it may be. More concerned with their own petty ambitions than they are with the people that they ostensibly govern. That Sunak's now caught in this 
bizarre little pincer movement of his own making, but with Suella Braverman desperately trying to exert ever more pressure upon a prime minister for entirely personal reasons, because of her weird fever dream about deporting desperate people to a country where relatively recently refugees were getting shot dead by police. And here we are. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three um, is the number you need to answer this question and this question not alone because we can all you can pile in on whatever you want on a Marvin Gaye day you can kind of ring in from any angle on the subject that's central to our discussions and that subject is the emergency law that can somehow save Rwanda policy. The, the Nazis had something called the Enablement Law, I think, in 1933. And, and it essentially gave Hitler the right to decide what was true and what was not true. Uh, it, it dispensed with the need of Parliament to um, uh, scrutinise legislation or, 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 or decide on laws. I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that we're kind of in, in, in that territory yet, but I think we're in the foothills of it. If, if the Prime Minister is serious, the, the idea that if you just get a majority in Parliament, then you can decide what is real and what is not real. So what's going on? 0345 6060 973. Why is Rishi Sunak, why is James Cleverly flirting with the possibility of just abandoning reality? And pretending to believe that if you can get a parliamentary majority to state that an unsafe country is safe, then suddenly and somehow the country becomes safe. And don't take my word for this stuff, by the way. Uh, take the word of Lord Sumption, former um, Supreme Court judge, who has said in terms almost exactly the same thing. It doesn't matter how much legislation you pass. You don't change facts by passing a bill. Um, it, it, it's pretty straightforward. For Parliament simply to say facts are different would be constitutionally really quite extraordinary. The understatement of a legal mind there. Former Supreme Court Justice accusing Parliament of, well, accusing Sunak of using Parliament to, and I quote, change the facts. Change the facts. Unbelievable. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. It's 20 past 10. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 23 minutes after 10, I, I, after 10 even. I've got more for you. Um, Jonathan Sumption, next Supreme Court Justice. Right? I have never heard of them trying to change the facts by law. For as long as black isn't white, the business of passing acts of parliament to say that it is is profoundly discreditable. Again, the understatement of a legal mind. I'd go a little bit further. Um, it's, 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 it's unprecedented. It's appalling. It's disgusting. It's unbelievable. Not so much when Johnson did it with the prorogation of Parliament, with Cummings sitting in the background, cackling, but for someone, Rishi Sunak, who's supposed to be sensible, suggesting if we can pass a law that says an unsafe country is safe, then that country automatically becomes safe. Ria's in Westminster. Ria, what is going on? Um, I think the Prime Minister is very skilled in numbers, but he's not a good politician. Mm. I feel he is just out of his depth and he is taken away from what he's really good at. In terms of changing the law or really everything about Rwanda, I feel the UK is now and has been for a few years just reacting to problems and they have lost, we have lost, I am British and I'm very proud of that, mm. we have lost our leading position in the world. I feel that a right way to tackle this is, number one, the government has to change its language when they talk about immigrants. Yeah. They are very, unfortunately, full of hate. The conversation is full of bigotry. And it's very sad to see it coming from politicians who are immigrants themselves. Um, I feel that the problem with... Um, the Rwanda thing, is, as I said, it's, they are being reactive and instead they should actually do the things properly. Well, they've created well, the problem, Maria. This is, everyone misses this. You shut down all the safe routes into this exactly. country for bona fide asylum seekers and you create unsafe routes and then you try exactly. and build a government on a promise to close down the unsafe routes as well, which is legally and logistically impossible. Do you feel, as I do, that there is a very deliberate conflation here by people like Suella Braverman, and now, unfortunately, by, by Sunak and even Cleverly, 
that this appeals to people who don't like foreigners. It's got nothing to do with asylum or refugee status. It's why they keep using the word illegals. It really, really appeals to people who've got a problem with foreigners, first and foremost. Um, I agree to some extent. I also think that the politicians in charge of this are too deep in their personal grievances against each other yeah. and it's just it's not no one's really thinking about the good of the country the uk and any country in the world needs and has to have skilled immigrants 100 well, percent of course the in terms of tackling this problem i think they should just see what is the source of the most number of illegal immigrants say country x and then check what are the ages of the people who are illegal? I think the majority are very young people just yes. looking for a new chance. And instead of just stopping the boats and just being in your little cocoon here trying to fight people coming, you should go and support the agencies that are providing education for these people. Support work um, um, experience. But, but that, support- that won't work for the people that the Tories are appealing to because they, they're, they're like, you know, Goneril and Regan in King Lear talking about their dad's retinue of troops. They want to whittle it down to zero. What need one? These are these are zero-sum games. They deny the necessity of immigration. They sometimes dress it up euphemistically and claim, oh, we just want control. But you, you, we know the people that they're appealing to. We saw them on Saturday dancing to Suella Braverman and little Tommy Tenname's tune. They, 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 they do not legislate for sensible people, even sensible people who want to see more... Um, evidence of, of, of control on immigration. They're not talking to those people, I don't think. No, no they are not. And I think, um, I do not believe this is a majority. So I, I run a small business mm. and I have different types of clients and employees and patients. And throughout the years, like I've met people who are extreme left, extreme right. Yes, of course. And I have never, never met anyone who is against foreigners. I don't know the small oh, majority that they're appealing to, <laughs> but maybe I am not living as in much my as, own little No, level. not at all. Not as much as I used to do, Ria. <laughs> but I used to be in daily contact with them. I could barely go on Twitter without disappearing under a tidal wave of their filth. But um, I guess I, in, in some ways they got what they wanted. And uh, and it turned to it turned to dust in their hands, or indeed it turned to that word that James Cleverly is being reminded of of using um, in a, in almost every interview that he's done today. Twenty eight minutes after ten is the time. Thank you, Ria. Mick, it's in Plymouth. Mick, what's he up to? What's going on? Um, I'm actually very scared, James, and I've worked it out. Go on. He's not trying to change the laws. He's trying to make people think he can change the laws. Right. Well, I can foresee a snap election coming up yeah. when he says. Britain is not sovereign anymore. We need to change the laws. We need to leave this. We need to leave that. And then I think we'll see a resurgence of our old favourite phrase, take back control. It's not impossible, is it? I mean, I, I mean you, you, you know that we are doing that thing that we sometimes do, which is imagining quite a complicated and sophisticated plan is in place when it could, yeah. it could just be what's going to get me through today, lads. Well, I, I got thinking last night that we keep getting told that, that the public want Rwanda. The public are massively yeah. in favour of it. They're not. Do no. you remember back to Question Time? Yes, they of course. The Conservative. I, I, they did. No, I do mm. remember that. And no one put their hand up. But even That's even right. even even if they were in favour of it, the, the polling on Preston, Preston last night showed that they don't know what it is. We don't know what it is. Two thirds no, of the but... population think that if your application is successful, you come back to the UK. Now, some people would think that was better than staying in Rwanda, and some people would think that was awful. It seems to me, as I said to Ria, that the people Sunak and certainly Braverman are appealing to are the ones that love the idea of everyone being stuck in Rwanda forever, and none of them ever coming back here. But that the policy. So even people who think they support it, I never forget Ian Duncan Smith doing this. He thought he supported the policy, but he didn't know what it was. No, and I think it doesn't matter what people think it is. All that people, all they're going to try and get people to think is, well, our parliament is being stopped by foreigners from doing what we want. And it's and, and it's not foreigners, it's the Supreme Court, it's the United Kingdom Supreme Court. But on the front page of the Daily Mail today, I'm reading about foreign courts. On, on Rishi Sunak's Twitter feed, I'm reading about foreign courts. Uh, how's your philosophy, Mick? Uh, hang on, how's your philosophy? Um, shabby, I've only got a degree in law. All right, who said this? Which famous legal mind said, the incredibly powerful and the incredibly stupid have one thing in common. They don't alter their view to fit the facts. They alter the facts to fit their views. Uh, let's go Aristotle or someone Greekish. Close. Another guess? Uh, 
James O'Brien Circus 2015. God, very close. Doctor Who. <laughs> I'm glad I should have got that. <laughs> it's 10.31. Ten Thomas Watts has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Never, how it doesn't happen um, in, in sort of violent moments. Uh, the really bad stuff happens slowly. Was it... Um, that's it, Michael Rosen, who talked about the carpet slippered creep of fascism. They, they don't come in jackboots, but they come in carpet slippers. I think it was. Looking at just reading last night, actually, about the Enablement Act, March the 23rd, 1933, which essentially allowed Adolf Hitler to enact laws, including ones that have violated the Constitution of Germany, the Weimar Constitution, without the approval of either Parliament. Or, or the president, and the, of course that, that that had to be passed in Parliament. <laughs> the the law that allowed him to make the laws. Uh, it, essentially, it's it's the point at which he became a dictator. And the reason why the public were um, uh, not up in arms about it was largely because of uh, I, uh, the. the um, fear that had been stoked in the population of, of the enemy within. Uh, and it is from that fear, that deliberately stoked but bogus fear that the, that the Holocaust grew. Uh, and that's why you have these laws. This is what Adam Wagner explained yesterday. That's why you have these international conventions that, that prevent countries from doing things that lead to Holocaust. That's how the, the human rights lawyer, Adam, explained to us yesterday. And, and it took me back when he used that language, as in I was taken aback. It didn't take me back to 1933 because I was 40 years off being born. But uh, <laughs> um, it, it really took me aback to hear that, to be reminded of Churchill's vision when he, uh, essentially, when he came up with the European Convention on Human Rights. Winston Churchill, you know, the one that all these cosplaying weirdos claim to revere. And then the United Nations conventions on things like refugees and torture. There's an article in Rupert Murdoch's Times today. I kid you not, I don't know what the newspapers were printing on March the 22nd, 1933, but you, you have to presume that some of them, the ones that were entirely on board with the Nazi party, would have been writing articles along the lines of Parliament's parliamentary legislation or the need for Parliament to enact laws has had its day. And there's a column in the Times today that says human rights treaties have had their day. Human rights treaties have had their day. That's in the Times. Paper of record, page 25. Human rights treaties have had their day. Down with that sort of thing. Which is fine, unless you're a human. I've always said that about human rights. Ever since the, the sort of Daily Mail columnists started, what they do when they don't really understand why something's important, but they're certain they don't like it, they come up with a funny phrase, like they re-spell it, like human rights, with Y-O-O-M-A-N. I think it was Richard Littlejohn that did that. You can't really... I mean, how, how can you have a problem with human rights if you're a human? Well, I, I, I just don't like them being extended to all humans. I want to take them away from some humans. Well, then it's not a right, is it? It's a privilege. It becomes a... Pri ah, there it is. So you're all in favour of privileges because not everybody gets them, but you don't like rights because they're universal. And these people who, who truly, you know, the kind of people who count how many poppies you're wearing because they claim to be patriotic, they're the, they're the ones that, that revere beyond uh, uh, sense in some cases, or certainly beyond history. They revere Winston Churchill. And this is one of his proudest legacies. And they want to trash it. And the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party can call for the abandonment of the rule of law and keep his job. I, I, I often do this. I really like to talk to old-fashioned Tories on days like today, and I usually quote Melanie. Look what they've done to my song, Ma, which is a beautiful song. Do you know, I might play you a bit of that a little later. It's a beautiful... Don't look at me like that. It's a beautiful song. It just gets me every time. It's so poignant. Look what they've done to my song, Ma. Look what they've done to your party. David Gork yesterday talking about uh, Leanderthal. And just sort of, you can almost hear the spluttering incomprehension of what's happened to his party. He was in it up until four years ago. Vanessa's in Wokingham. Vanessa, what would you like to say? 
Oh, hello, James. Thanks for having me on. Always oh. a great pleasure to speak to you, Thank as you, always. Vanessa, the saviour of, of our uh, right-thinking nation, anyway. Mm. Um, well, I, I was listening on my way back from looking after my granddaughter yesterday, yeah. three, <laughs> in the car, and I was listening to his speech, and I got more and more, I think, apoplectic. And when he, he, when he said the words, no foreign government or institution will dictate to us a sovereign parliament of the United Kingdom um, will tell us what to do. And I thought, uh oh, here we go again, yeah, yeah. the sovereignty issue. And it's come back because I mean, I just couldn't believe it. You know, I mean, I think they know they will not get this through. It will be too long winded and difficult to extricate from all the treaties that we've signed. And, nor, and obviously, nor should they. You know, and well, well, that, getting right, it through the House of Lords as well is uh, is is, well, is, is exactly. going to be impossible. But you'd hope. That, I mean, what, where, where have the Tories gone? I suppose. Well, you that's know, the it, thing. Go on. They haven't. They have. What I listened then later on to mm. other callers um, yes. on, on other programmes. What? And there were they. Oh, you, sorry, you <laughs> faithless woman. Honestly, <laughs> Vanessa, no, no, no. I, I can't just dip in and out. I Fair just dip in and okay, out. Okay, that's all right. That's allowed. <laughs> Uh, but they, there were people calling in who were absolutely apoplectically, um, like saying, "He's right. We've got to take back control <laughs> of our, you oh, know." And them. this is, uh, you know, it was like the Brexit thing all over again. We are sovereign. It's almost the appealing to the red meat, the red wall, the older Tories who yes. are still, you know, think of Britain as the, uh, you know, the the. the Paramount, um, furious jingoists, to be exactly. kind, to be generous, National furious, ignorant jingoists. Jingoism. And I think that's what this is an election issue. And I think that's what they're pushing, that they will take care of our place in the world that is right to us. I mean, you, you know, we, we can't trust them, you know, because they've already, you know, you've got an anti-strike election, at, mm. you know, got the new, the new law strict p- people strict not being able to vote, you know, because I've just heard an advert, you know, you have to have ID, you know, all these things pushing them to be almost like omnipotent in, in yeah, many ways. But, yeah. but I think this, I, I think deep down they thought we, we've got to appeal to the red meat. We've got to get these people back on board. And I think this is the issue. I, I really think I, listening to other people. I just don't think this is going like Natasha. It's there's too much involvement here. They'll never get it by spring no take, no it's designed to, to just rile up rather than actually yes. deliver i i have some optimism that the constituency they're appealing to is a lot smaller than they think because i i honestly think so but then he kept going on about the people the people and i kept saying i'm screaming in the car i'm not your people will you stop it and and it is a minority but i don't know whether they're appealing to people who are thinking Oh, yeah, I don't know if I like all these foreigners coming in. You know, you just don't know how people vote. It's unbelievable it's very when you're true. out there and talking it, it's, to it, people. It's very true, although the polling at the moment blames the government for what is going on. So the people you, you, you describe, the furious, ignorant jingoists who think that all the problems in their life are caused by Polish lorry drivers rather than Tory governments, rather than 13 years of Tory government... Um, uh, or, 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 you know, Afghans in boats coming into Dover. They're the real cause of, of all our problems. It's got nothing to do with the people siphoning money out of our formerly publicly owned companies or, or, or trousering epic sums of cash for VIP contracts during PP. No, they're all great. They're on my side. It's the flipping Polish lorry drivers and the Afghan refugees that are the real problem. Um, that Those people, I, I, I think, um, are not going to be the uh, electoral viagra that they were last time because that brexit thing was very different there was still an idea abroad in 2019 that brexit was desirable so the promise to get brexit done appealed beyond the red meat or or, or the pink meat actually to to be more uh, accurate it, it, it appealed beyond the furious gammon uh, because everyone wanted to get brexit done even people that knew it was awful wanted to get it done because by then there was no prospect of getting it undone. So I, I don't know. I think it might be a uh, slight miscalculation, but it's still bloody ugly. Vanessa, thank you. It's quarter to 11. James O'Brien on LBC. 
James O'Brien on LBC. It is 10.48. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, <laughs> Peter and Solly, I was Vanessa calling you from Wokingham. Down with lefty town names. <laughs> I hadn't noticed that before. We should all move to Wokingham. Seriously, I tell you what, 30p Lee will probably want to close down Wokingham if anyone tells him about it. He'll be, he'll be calling for, ignore the laws that protect Wokingham. Down with Wokingham. Um, it's mad, right? It's just really, really ugly. What, where we are. I, and the nearest thing you can get to optimism is a belief that when Rishi Sunak uh, says that he's planning to uh, try to pass legislation that would make an unsafe country safe or make the moon cheese or make up, down or black, white or, or whatever it may be, the, the, the closest thing we've got to optimism as sensible people who understand what's going on is the hope that he doesn't mean it. I, I mean, that's just incredible, right? Think back. I know it's a little bit cliched, but I, I think it's helpful to the Olympic opening ceremony in 2012, when almost everybody, except a few uh, fascistic Tories, almost everybody just just felt great, just for one night. I know austerity was underway, I know things were far from perfect, but we just felt great that night. You sat around the telly, or perhaps you were lucky enough to be there, and Danny, it was Danny Boyle, was it? And uh, and that opening ceremony uh, with, um, what's the, what's the Liverpudlian? fella called the beautiful children's writer frank cottrell boyce i think he was involved as well and they just put together a pageant in the purest sense of the word a british pageant a uk pageant things that we were proud of things that we were proud of that was only 11 years ago can you believe that 11 years that's all it was and now you've got the deputy chairman of the conservative party calling for Laws to be ignored and a Prime Minister pretending to believe that he can change reality by simply getting an act through Parliament. Breathtaking. How do you account for it? How do you explain it? Uh, meaning of some words that we've used today. Jingoist, jingoism is a, is a belief that your country is always best, regardless of the evidence. So it's a softer word than racism, but, but it's no less dangerous a concept. Jingoism explains an awful lot of what's happened in recent years, more, more than racism does. Racism is, is what Braverman is appealing to. But jingoism is, is a little bit more of what Sunak is appealing to when he talks about foreign courts in the context of a conversation about the United Kingdom's Supreme Court. You raise the spectre of a foreign court. What's wrong with a foreign court? The only answer to that question is, well, it depends on what laws they enact, James. It depends on what laws they impose. So you don't judge the probity or the efficiency or the efficacy of a court by the nationality of the people in it any more than you judge the uh, benefits or uh, bad things about a single market by the nationality of the... This is what we've been doing now since 2016. Oh, I don't care about the quality. I just want to see the passports of the people involved. I don't want to be part of the European Union. It's got foreigners in it. But I don't want to obey those laws because they smell a bit French. That's Jacob Rees-Mogg's entire attitude to politics. Oh, I don't like those laws because they smell a bit French. And you say, but is it a good law? Is it good for the people of this country to have, I don't know, uh, legislation that, 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 that governs the cleanliness of our beaches or our waterways? Internationally binding legislation that's been agreed supranationally by a group of partners all pulling together in the same direction. Is that a good thing? No, it's a bad thing because it's the French are there. But it's a really good law. I don't care. There's some Germans involved in it. That's, that's jingoism. That's Brexit. That's number wang. It's just bonkers. And now here we are. So we can't part. No, don't like these laws. Don't like these treaties. Don't like that United Nations business because it's got all the Johnny foreigners in it. You know, we, we, got, we, got, we can have our own United Nations and call it the United Kingdom. Except I don't really like the Scots either, you might say if you were one of these people. Or the Welsh. And I think we could all do without Northern Ireland. And, and you think I'm exaggerating. But when it looked as if getting our country back would involve chopping it in half and waving goodbye to Northern Ireland, which I think will probably happen in my lifetime, they all claimed that was a good thing. And it was actually what they'd wanted all along because everybody knew exactly what they were voting for. And it is, isn't it? I'm glad we're together today. I'm glad I'm not, not off. 
because this is one of those days where you, you actually, do you know, when I'm doing the book tour, which I've been one of the most enjoyable experiences of my life, the most common phrase I hear, and this is a little bit boastful, a bit conceited, but you're used to it by now, thank you for keeping me sane. And I always feel a bit daft when you say that to me. I don't know quite what you mean by that. You've heard it on the show as well. You've heard callers say it. But these are the days, aren't they? These are the days where we just describe what's happening to each other and realise that we're not going mad. It really is happening, and the rest of the world really is not noticing or not caring or being quietly supportive of it all as the really mad stuff happens. And why is it happening? Today, jingoism. My country's better than yours. I, 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 you know, I, I, under what other possible reading of humanity could Leanderthal conclude that he is of value or worth except by dint of some weird accident of birth that allows him to think he's better than them over there. So stick him on the planes and forget about the laws. So power grab this, worst case scenario. It's a postponement of reality, best case scenario. Donna's in Norwich, where indeed I was last week on that very book tour. Donna, what would you like to say? Ah, oh, well, yes, nice city, isn't it? Yeah, we yeah, were very nice chippy opposite the Epic Studios down at the bottom of Magdalene Street. Have you ever been there? Oh. Oh, no, I haven't actually. Oh, hi- I, I think that's quite a new one. Highly but... recommended, Donna. Highly recommended. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, hello. I haven't talked to you before. Hello, so welcome. I'm, I'm a bit nervous. It's I've only been me. trying to scrub. I've just put you at your ease with fish and chips based banter. What more can I do? <laughs> I think that's the ultimate, actually. I just, I'm completely still relaxed now. Good. Um, I just, I'm very unnerved by this. I have been for the last few years. Um, very, very unnerved, and I absolutely hate it. Um, I feel like it's behaving like the the ultimate spoil, entitled, um, throwing up the board, and like yes. we don't, we don't like what's going on. So, and I just knew, like, a couple of days before they had this vote, I thought if it doesn't go like the Supreme ruling, I thought if it doesn't go through, then he'll announce that he wants to change the law, and. It's what he's trying to do. It's like, um, isn't it? It's like an old monarch, you know, an absolute one and being absolute ruler yes. and changing. Yes, well, Johnson oh, I can't wanted marry that. Anne Boleyn, so I'm gonna. Yeah, yeah. It's what Henry. Do you know what I mean? And I it's do. the same. It doesn't matter that it's hundreds of years apart, but it's exactly the same sort of mindset. I can't get my own way, and we can. We're in power. And we, and God, there's so much going on in my head, but basically you get the gist. I, I do get the gist. Um, and, and, and no, I, I, I think you've put it very well, actually, Donna. I think you're describing a mindset, and, and whether it's jingoistic or, or, or something else entirely, I, I, well, other people can decide, but they are saying, oh dear, we, we, we're, we're falling foul of the rules. The problem must be the rules, not us. Yes. So we and saw also, it with Owen you know, Patterson. We saw it with Owen Patterson. Yes, and also this jingoism, I think that they're not particularly either way. I genuinely feel that they, they're not bothered because they can't be, because if they know what, they, what they're doing and what they've done to this country. They, they know. So I think the people that they know, the people who are jingoistic, and that's who they're appealing to, you know, um, we want our country back. You know, we, yeah, we believe yeah. in our sovereignty. And I, so I think that they're, they're not either here nor there with jing- jingoism, but they're appealing to the people that they know that are like that. And, and we don't know how many there are, but we do know that they, they you know, that the numbers can grow. So if the mail in the Telegraph, as seems likely, come down behind Braverman and the nature of the conversation shifts, Braverman perhaps becomes a sort of de facto opposition figure, causing constant problems for Rishi Sunak from within his own party by constantly insisting that he should be moving further and further and this is not even an exaggeration or an opinion insisting that he should move further away from the rule of law that becomes an actual point for the conservative party for members of the conservative party like leander told to rally around that moving away from the rule of law and everybody writes their columns for the Times and their columns for the Telegraph as if as if this is just another step on a perfectly normal road. Just business as usual in, in Brexit Britain. You've got the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party calling for people to ignore the laws. And they're supposed to be the ones that care. So it's, it's, it's one of the final pieces of the jigsaw of fascism for me because, of course, 
They never care about the rule of law. They never care about rights. They just care about themselves. They pretend to care about things up to the point where they don't like them anymore. They don't care about patriotism. They don't care about the cenotaph because they were the ones that summoned little Tommy Ten names and his, his, his band of thugs, his bands of racist hooligans. Deliberately, Braverman did it. You care about the cenotaph, you care about the sanctity of Remembrance Day, then you let people march for an armistice up the road, you categorically don't blow a whistle and summon racist hooligans to the cenotaph who will do their best to desecrate it. You just don't, don't care about anything, just break things. In the, you break things constantly because you think that if you could break everything, then finally you might actually understand the world around you. Was it Hobbes? I think it was Hobbes who called life nasty, brutish and short. And it is. But we spend most of our time, most of us spend most of our time trying to make things better. The world is a confusing place. It's inconsistent. It's unfair. And it can be very, very complicated. But you don't make it easier to understand by breaking everything, including the things that protect us from the nastiness and the brutishness of life. And yet these people seem to think if they can just break one more thing, we've broken, uh, we've broken the European Union, broken membership of the European Union, we've broken that. I, could just, I tell you what, what are you going to break next? The European Convention on, yeah, break that. United Nations Convention on Refugees, break that. International commitments to the opposition of torture by sovereign states. Yeah, down we get rid of that, get rid of that. How right, about safe, safe country, the definition of the word safe. Well, we can change it by passing laws to say that somewhere unsafe is safe. That would be great, wouldn't it? Something untrue is true, something true is untrue. Just pass a law, make it so. And we thought at the time that when Kellyanne Conway started talking about alternative facts that that was a peculiarly Trumpian or American problem. Well, if you still believe that, I've got, um, I've got a bridge to send you. James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, three minutes after 11 is the time. Uh, we move on now. We may ret- well, we'll have to return to this territory, uh, whether Rishi Sunak is serious or not about abandoning the rule of law for uh, reasons that I hope are obvious. But we'll have a look now at the problems Keir Starmer has got with his party, which are um, nowhere near comparable to the ones Sunak has got, but are still worth our attention. He has um, endured the uh, 56 Labour MPs yesterday, refused his request declined his request to abstain on a vote calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. It's a, 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 it was a Scottish National Party amendment calling for the ceasefire. I, I thought that the Liberal Democrats amendment, which I don't think was voted on, was, was put best. Leila Moran, who has now lost, she, she revealed this morning, has lost a family member, um, a, a member of her extended family in Gaza, has, has now been killed. So she speaks from a, a, a possibly a unique perspective in, in Westminster. But the call for a two-state solution, an immediate bilateral ceasefire, and an insistence that Hamas should not be in charge, adding we need the bloodshed to stop and point clearly to a lasting peace. Now, I am going to try to have a sensible conversation about this and i don't mean that in a patronizing way because one of the reasons that things get a bit insensible is because emotions run so high and that's perfectly understandable you know normal even uh, for, for for people with wildly differing perspectives um but i do want to have a sensible conversation not specifically about the ceasefire itself but about keir starmer and the stance he has taken And I I want to know what you think of it. His explanation seems to me to be quite compelling, that he is essentially um, resisting a return to a failed strategy of containment and neglect, uh, calling for, uh, you know, uh, temporary pauses in the bombardment. Uh, But crucially, talking about what leadership is, I'll read you what he said. He said, I wanted to be clear about where I stood and where I will stand. Leadership is about doing the right thing. That is the least the public deserves and the least that leadership demands. Adding that every leader has a duty to forge a better and more secure future for both Palestinians and Israelis. And alongside leaders around the world, I have called throughout for adherence to international law, for humanitarian pauses to allow access for aid, food, water, utilities and medicine, and have expressed our concerns at the scale of civilian casualties. Much more needs to be done in this regard to ease the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. 
Jess Phillips uh, has walked away from her role as a uh, shadow minister for domestic violence in process, uh, in protest at this position, or, or at least in um, determination to uh, vote in favour of the ceasefire. Afzal Khan, uh, Manchester Gorton, Naz Shah, Paula Barker, um, Sarah Owen, Rachel Hopkins, Andy Slaughter, uh, MP for the constituency neighbouring mine in, in, in West London, have all also... Um, resigned their ministerial positions uh, in in her letter um, Yasmin Qureshi the MP for Bolton South East said the situation in Gaza desperately requires an immediate ceasefire to address the humanitarian catastrophe now I, I just some thoughts on this it, it, are they arguing about words so when Yasmin Qureshi calls for a humanitarian ceasefire and Keir Starmer calls for a humanitarian pause. Are, are they really at odds with each other? So, unless you think that a ceasefire now would be permanent, that Hamas would stop attacking Israel, Israelis, and Israel in the event of Hamas attacking them, as they have, uh, as Hamas has pledged they would continue to do, Israel would then retaliate. Then I'm not. I'm not dancing on the head of a pin here. It just strikes me that the difference between a humanitarian pause and a humanitarian ceasefire is semantic. Because as long as Hamas exists, then violence will continue in both directions. Hamas will attack Israel, and Israel will retaliate. And as long as Israel exists, Hamas will attack Israel. So I don't believe. The, the, the bit I find... Can I just stress something first as well before you start ringing in? in that you can hold conflicting ideas in your head at the same time. It doesn't make you dishonest or corrupt. You, you, you can desperately want a ceasefire, but also wonder whether calling for it is helpful you, for, a, for a politician like Starmer. You can honestly believe that Israel haven't got a hope in hell of eradicating Hamas and that they're more likely to be radicalizing future generations of terrorists and, and, and Israel haters by adopting this course of action, but you can't come up with a better one. Do, do you see what I mean? I, I don't want to have a binary conversation today. I want to have an intelligent and compassionate conversation. But... I also want to talk about the position that Keir Starmer has taken because he could call for a ceasefire a, a hundred times a day and there wouldn't be one. So what is the role of a political leader at a time like this? I, I, I sense the vaguest sniff of opportunism in the air from some people. Very easy to vote against the whip or to, or to decline the invitation of your leader and it plays well perhaps in your constituency. But if you are a leader and you need to adopt a plausible and pragmatic position while bearing in mind throughout that politics is the art of the possible, Starmer hopes by this time next year or shortly afterwards to be sitting at the table where these issues, where the future of Gaza is thrashed out by world leaders. And if he arrives with... If he arrives with slogans and slightly cynical posturing on his CV, I wonder whether he can be taken completely seriously. Yeah, can he sit down with whoever, whoever finally seeks to bring a two-state solution to this area? It's not going to be Benjamin Netanyahu, but can he sit down with them if he has called for Israel to stop responding to the October the 7th terror attack. So you see what I mean about having all sorts of, um, <laughs> don't be anti-semantic, there's a text at the top of my inbox, which in the tricky circumstances that we're navigating at the moment brought a much needed smile to my face, um, as indeed did Ben in Orpington's text, which says, thank you, James. I've been saying the same thing. O OMG, even. Thank you, James. Um, the difference is semantics all along. Stephen Glasgow disagrees. He says ceasefire means stop and talk and pause means stop and start again. But I think that's what I disagree with, Steve. Because I, I, I don't think it's going to stop. I think any ceasefire will only be a pause as long as Hamas is dedicated to the destruction of Israel. I, 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 I don't think that Hamas have a role to play in a two-state solution. And I don't think Likud 
Benjamin Netanyahu's party in its current form does either. That's something that gets slightly overlooked by much of the coverage. It's a chilling passage in a book Max Hastings wrote. I think it was a biography of Netanyahu's brother. And he quotes the young Benjamin Netanyahu in, in I don't want to misquote it or misrepresent it, but it, 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 it would make pretty grim reading for any Israeli who believes that Netanyahu is committed to or likely to, dis, to deliver peace or to deliver a two-state solution. So that there are some of the conflicting thoughts that I have. I don't think that this will work in, in the context of eradicating Hamas, and I don't really think they do either. I think they just want to hobble Hamas so uh, completely that the next bout of violence will be further off than it currently is. And I can't sit here and say that that is an ignoble aim, trying to ensure that the next bout of Hamas violence is much further off than it would currently be scheduled to be. But then how many Palestinian innocents have to die before that does become an ignoble aim? How many thousands more people have to die before anybody turns around and says it is a noble aim to either eradicate, eradicate or cripple Hamas, but it is not a aim for which 10,000 lives are a price worth paying, or 20,000, or 30,000, or half a million. So, you know, the existential threat to Israel runs through this conversation, if you're honest, like Blackpool through a stick of rock, actions undertaken in almost unique historical circumstances, historical and geographical circumstances. Just think of those Holocaust survivors liberated from a death camp by a member of the Red Army who turned to a fellow Jew and said, where do we go now? Where do we go now? In 1945, where do we go now? That's Israel. That's the answer to that question, an answer that appeared on the map three years later in its current form. So you can't, I'm afraid, however much you might want to, you can't depart from that. But at the same time, how many deaths is too many deaths? And crucially, I think, is there really that much difference between a humanitarian ceasefire and a humanitarian pause? If we agree, as we surely must, that whatever you call the cessation of attack, it will start again. That, that I think, is why I, I want to ceasefire. I want a ceasefire. I want a bilateral ceasefire. I can call for a bilateral ceasefire knowing that, really, you're putting all the moral pressure on Israel because no one realistically expects Hamas to uh, uh, observe one. Okay? Not forever. I want to ceasefire. If I was leader of the Labour Party, I would struggle not to let my head be led by my heart. I want to ceasefire. I, I, a bit like Jess Phillips, I would call for a ceasefire. I'd resign my shadow ministry because I want to vote for a ceasefire. But if I put my heart in the back seat and focused on what my head was telling me, I think perhaps I'd be like Keir Starmer. What is the point of calling for something that isn't going to happen? What would it do to me as a leader to be allied with a slightly lazy looking position, slightly in terms of the semantics? And ultimately, what's the difference between a humanitarian pause in combat that we know will continue and calling for a humanitarian ceasefire in a battle, a bigger battle that we know will not be over? So once again, I find myself compelled to remind you that you can hold conflicting thoughts in your head at the same time. So we'll talk about that. Should Starmer have back to ceasefire? 03456060973. And then a, a rather less inflammatory conversation. I don't think this is a particularly big problem for Keir Starmer. I think if you're honest, then that line there about calling for uh, humanitarian pauses to allow access for aid, food, water, utilities and medicine uh, and much more needs to be done in this regard to ease the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Those are the points that he should be making, but he should be making them more loudly and more 
powerfully, more loudly and more powerfully. But it's not actually a polar opposition to the position that Jess Phillips and Afzal Khan and Sarah Owen and Rachel Hopkins find themselves in. That's what, that's what I think anyway. So, so should he have backed a ceasefire? Should he have allowed a free vote? That's a bit technical, isn't it? A bit pedantic. Should he have allowed a free vote? Or, um, or has he actually got it right on this one? And then underpinning those questions comes the question of whether or not this is actually a, a, a big problem for him. So Sean in Leeds, a couple of texts just to provide a little bit more context. And then it's mystery hour at 12, which is why you know we can do two very heavy subjects this morning and, and uh, look forward to the light relief together of mystery hour. Um, a, a ceasefire would perpetuate the cycle of violence, leaving Hamas in power would be a mistake. That, that's Hillary Clinton. And, and it's right, but so is other stuff. So is other stuff. Um, your heart must always lead your head. That's not true, unfortunately. You know, that, that would be Lee Anderton's motto if he had a heart uh, or a head, actually, come to that. And then the point about the question about where do we go now and you asking me where do the Palestinian people go now? Uh, it, it shouldn't mean taking someone else's home or land or history. And, th and that's what I mean, that both those positions... <laughs> can be sustained in your head at the same time. I think of the two in opposition to each other. It was a Daniel Finkelstein column in The Times that, that introduced me to that question of where do we go now, and it, and it will never leave me. But there was also uh, a, a, an Israeli politician at the time of the um, foundation of the modern state of Israel who, who described it as a land without a people for a people without a land, which it just wasn't. There were 700,000 people living there many of whom were just moved. And, and you can hold that in your head at the same time as well. The people who asked where do we go now needed a land, but it was not a land without a people for a people without a land. So these contradictions, these simple statements of fact cannot be ignored or, or indeed allowed, you can't allow them to be overlooked or undermined. I've got no idea what's going to happen in this phone-in, but I am, in a sense, looking forward to it. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 21 minutes after 11. Just before we get stuck into the uh, uh, Gaza ceasefire question, um, I'm going to read you the definition that the government uses to define extremism under the prevent strategy. And then I'm going to ask you quite an interesting question that you can ponder for the rest of the day. So extremism is defined by this government in, in their own documentation as a vocal or active opposition to fundamental British values, including democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty and mutual respect and tolerance of different faiths and beliefs. So unless I'm very much mistaken... Lee Anderson, the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, should refer himself to prevent as, uh, 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 as an extremist, vocal, active opposition to the rule of law. That you thought, perhaps you thought I was exaggerating in the first hour? Perhaps. But that's the government's own definition of extremism. <laughs> And Rishi Sunak has said he won't condemn him because of his strength of feeling. That's what vocal means. That's what active means. So extremism, according to the government, which is, you know, a stepping stone to terrorism, it's the sort of intellectual wing of terrorism. I don't think anyone's ever used the word intellectual in the same sentence as Leanderthal before, but here we are. Vocal or active opposition to fundamental British values, including democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, and mutual respect and tolerance of different faiths and beliefs. I don't think the finest lawyer in the land could get Lee Anderson off the charge of being an extremist under the government's own prevent strategy after he publicly and vocally called for an abandonment of the rule of law. That, anyway, I just stick that out there. 23 after 11. Back to Starmer and the ceasefire. James is in Oxford. James, what would you like to say? James, hi. I think uh, he's quite right to stand where he stood, and I don't think it's time for party politics. I think that mm. um, at the moment there is absolutely no chance of a ceasefire while Hamas exists. I think the um, it's, it's disturbing that the, 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 the least number of people are actually calling for Hamas to surrender. No one's talking about hostages. 
Um, you well, know, that's simply see, that. I mean, listen, that, that is simply not true. I, I, I think well, that, but in fact, it's quite disingenuous. There's all, I mean, you, you can talk about brackets if you want or parentheses, but anybody, nobody who's calling for a ceasefire wants Hamas to carry on attacking Israel. And nobody oh, no, who's calling for a, that, not, nobody who's not calling for a ceasefire that. wants the hostages to stay hostage. And, and it, it is disingenuous because you are calling for a ceasefire. You're calling for Israel to stop bombing Gaza. And it's what a battery almost to bring in the other elements of it and presume you know what people think, because you don't. I, well, I, 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 sure. I mean, it's, so it's, I've heard it said a lot, and I'm just a yeah, bit I impatient mean, I just, with I just, it. I'm just, I mean, I'm, I've been all over this for the last month. I'm Jewish Australian. I'm, I'm worried about what's going on in London and Sydney. Of course. Um, and, and, you know, I just, all I see is, and this morning, particularly on social media, or particularly on X, you know, politicians saying, aren't I fancy? Look how clever I am. I voted for a ceasefire. There is some um, of that out there, you know, I think. There is know, some and of I, that well, out maybe, there. maybe it's the way the algorithm works when I'm, I'm on it. But, you know, it, to, to say that you want anything but um, a, a, a proper end to this conflict is, is, is ludicrous. To, you know, Israel will continue to retaliate, and they so, so they should, but Hamas will not stop. And until they do, there's no chance of any kind of solution. And you mentioned Netanyahu, but you, you, how, I'm both fan, but, you know, at the moment, I, I want strength. How, how feasible do you really think it is that Hamas will be wiped out? It's, it, I don't think it's feasible. I think. But that's that what you've just offered them. up as the but only condition for, for stopping the bombardment. So how else will it happen, James? Well, that's the point, isn't it? I, it won't. And but so the, but then how many people have to, to die? How many people have to die before you say enough is enough? Actually, I'm going to make you answer question. that question. How many? Yeah. I, I, look, I don't want to see a single person killed. Too late. I, how I, many, how know, many well, before you say enough is enough? Well, until all the Hamas are dead, I'm very happy to see that. So a Every million? A million innocents? Oh, uh, James, I can't give you an answer. I don't want to see innocents killed. Half a million. But until... 50,000? <laughs> you've, you've got a... You've got a, a I don't, I don't think it's... I don't who, think this is funny. And, and, and no, I'm, I'm, I'm not given laughing you a fa- at you. I'm laughing at because I can't give you an answer. Because well, I don't but you have to. One. You have to have a moral compass. I have, some, I, have a, I have a moral You can't just keep these platitudes about we've got to get rid of Hamas. That, that's that's 5,000 dead, 10,000 dead, <clears throat> 20,000 dead, 50,000 dead. Ceasefire, the last ceasefire. No, but you've simultaneously said, you've simultaneously said you don't think that they will ever be eradicated, but you think Israel has to carry on bombing no, Gaza. I, I think we will remove Hamas as it stands and some other group will join in and, and line up behind them. It's and and you refuse, the you refuse to go to the place where you have to contemplate the number of deaths that that would involve. I'm, I'm not refusing to. I don't think it's possible. So to. how many? I don't, I don't. It's impossible to answer your question. It isn't. Because there isn't there there's isn't plenty of people just... queuing up today saying five thousand is already too many. You see, so they're calling for a ceasefire. So it's not impossible yeah. to answer that question. The people that but you've the, just, you're, the people you've just insulted, the people you've just one insulted side. have answered that question today. So are, it is possible yeah. to answer it. What's your answer? My answer is that I think that there will be casualties in war. That's not a and number. That is, it, well, there is no there is no number which is good and is, is, there there's it no is. Good so it's number. limitless, limitless death of civilians in no, pursuit of no what good. you've described as an unachievable goal. James, that's not what I said. I said I don't believe there's a number which is right. I don't think any number is correct. Well, then you but want I a ceasefire. Understand. Well, I, I eventually, but Hamas won't. <laughs> but, but, but when? No, hey, hey, you're holding perhaps not quite as contradictory thoughts in your head as I am. But you have to go to these places, James. And, and, I, and I'm not going to let you not go there, but I fully expected you not to answer that question. The people calling for a ceasefire have answered it. The people calling for a humanitarian pause perhaps have not. But what they haven't answered, the people calling for a ceasefire, is, is the question of how many Israeli deaths are to be tolerated or to be permitted or to be accommodated when Hamas take up arms again and launch the next attack that they have promised to launch. So, you, 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 I, 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 well, I think James perhaps unintentionally demonstrated the difficulty of, of, of being fully committed to one side or the other. We need strength, but it's an unachievable goal. Well, that, oh, dear. Paul's in Twickenham. Paul, what would you like to say? Uh, uh, James, I'd like to say that a humanitarian pause is like the uh, breaks in a boxing match. You know, yes. you have 15 of them while one, while, and then they pummel each other after each uh, break. But, uh, but after, then again, if there weren't any breaks, then probably more boxing matches would end in death and serious injury than they currently do. 
That's no, uh, that's absolutely right. But yes. James, the point is, there's no risk in calling for a ceasefire. And let me explain why. Go on. A ceasefire is not a call for disarmament. Let's look at it from the Israeli point of view. I'll just deal with that first. OK, you don't have that long, but I'll give you as much time as I can before right. the news. If, if there is a universal call or for a ceasefire, mm. no one is asking Israel to disarm. What they could do would be to say, right, We'll, we've got Gaza surrounded, we've got all our tanks, all our things. We will, we will say to the Hamas, we will stop firing on a certain time. We will cease fire. Mm. That's not permanent. It, it could start up again at any time, but we will cease fire. We will spare the lives of the people being massacred and tormented in Gaza. I think if they did that, Hamas would actually be prepared to release some hostages, negotiate exchange of prisoners. I don't know, but I think if Israel responded by to a call for both sides to cease fire, by cease firing itself, I think that Hamas would do something. Now, we can't say where this would lead. But Hamas, Hamas have, to... have stated the opposite. I, I, I know it's, it's hard to pin down who speaks for who but they have stated that they would launch another attack they intend to launch another attack at the, yes, at the I, I first hear opportunity this argument, James but let's we well, you need, can't I butt think... your way out of that Paul you can't no, say gonna, Hamas have said they're going to kill more Jews but no. I don't really believe them therefore we should stop bombing Gaza no no I'm not saying that James if, you kind if, of are, if, if Israel were to cease fire and Hamas were to try and launch further attacks yes. of the kind then Israel would have every right to uh, to, to defend itself against that. But there's been a game changer here, James. Go on. Ga we're not in the position we were on October the 6th. We're in... No. There's a huge difference now. Israel is now very, very well alert to the risk of uh, further attacks from Hamas. Yes. We need... So they've, they've got Hamas surrounded with their tanks. They've got their air force. They're in a position... To go back to my boxing match analogy, to, although yeah, the terrorists... To give them some breathing space to let humanity... So you support what Keir Starmer did? No, I don't. Oh, I say they're sorry. in a position to say... <laughs> they're in a position to cease fire yeah. and say, if you behave yourself, we'll never exterminate you, but we've got you under our thumb. Now, release the hostages. We'll release some prisoners. Or we'll carry on. But then you, I think you perhaps underestimate, and I hope you don't. I, hope, I'm, I don't hope you're right, necessarily, because if you are, then we, we'll never know. But I think you underestimate the comfort with which Hamas contemplates the killing of Palestinian civilians. I genuinely think they see it as a recruiting sergeant. So that would be one fly in the ointment of your, uh, of, of your analysis. But only, only, only one. And... and you know, the difference between a humanitarian pause and a humanitarian ceasefire to you is clear. To many others, it's it's less clear. 11.32 is the time. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Is it fair, that question, do you think? I think I think it is. Um, but I, 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 the, the curse of the liberal is self-examination, isn't it? You can almost envy people who, who, who never stop to think about what they think. Never stop to think, in fact. Just feel, feel, never mind the um, thoughtfulness. Just feel the fury. and that, that. But I think it's a fair question to say, at what point would you say enough is enough? How many people in Palestine have to die? How many people in Gaza have to die? Innocents have to die. Can you even prove that Hamas has been eradicated? I don't think you can. And in the absence, A, of any way to prove that it has happened, or B, in the absence of any genuine belief that it's possible or plausible, then how many deaths is enough death? So at what point do you say, right, they, that's taught them. We've taught those terrorists a lesson by killing 20,000 innocent Palestinians. We've taught we taught those terrorists a lesson by killing fifty thousand. I don't know. I think it's a fair question. I, although I don't expect anybody to answer it ever, up to and including Benjamin Netanyahu. Well, I, there are some people in his cabinet who would say there is no price too high. There is no number too high. We're streeting with you later today uh, with Sheila Fogarty from one o'clock. So if you want to put your questions, including on this subject, I, I you know that's the way these phone-ins work. You've got to. Uh, um, uh, they've, they've got to respond to any. In fact, I think Sadiq Khan's with me tomorrow, is he? So the same same rules apply there. You ask these people anything you want, they put themselves up for scrutiny. It's not like going on a, 
a television station that has been set up solely to spread propaganda on behalf of your party and then you have MPs from the same side interviewing each other. So you can ring in and ask West Streeting anything you want with Sheila from one or indeed uh, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, tomorrow. I'm going to play you something because I, 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 the reason why my patience wears a little bit thin when people who are, I think we can say, four square behind the continuing bombardment of Palestinian civilians do that little bit of whataboutery on, on the hostages. It's not the perfect description of it, I don't think, the, the, the whataboutery. Um, but it but it does it, it questions the sincerity of people calling for a ceasefire when you say well why aren't they calling for Hamas to ceasefire I, the thing I read you at the top of the show top of the hour was the um, Leila Moran quote saying a bilateral ceasefire but I've, I've I do think there's mileage in the view that you don't you know Hamas is a death cult Israel is a democratic sovereign country so you can reason with one but you can't reason with the other uh, if you ever hear me calling for a ceasefire I'm calling for a bilateral ceasefire. But you have to also acknowledge the knowledge that you're really only calling, you might be calling for Hamas to cease fire, but you're not expecting them to do so. Whereas when you are calling for Israel to cease fire, you really are hoping that they will do so. So that perhaps is a crucial difference. And then when it comes to the hostages and the claim that people calling for a ceasefire are somehow ignoring the hostages, I think it's helpful sometimes to listen to the hostages or at least to their families, their direct families. Jonathan Ziegen is the son of Vivian Silver, believed to be held. She is a peace activist and is, it is believed currently being held by Hamas. And one of the best young... Can I say young? I guess everyone is young eventually, aren't they, if you hang around for long enough. One of the best young journalists I've ever worked with, Sekunda Kamani, who's now working at Channel 4 News, interviewed Yonatan, um, I think, the night before last. And, and this, is, this, is, well, this is him speaking to Sekunda. She was hiding in, um, in her closet... And um, we decided to stop uh, talking on the phone so uh, uh, she wouldn't be heard. And we wrote each other and uh, until she wrote me there inside the house. And then we just said our goodbyes. Um, I wrote her, I'm with you. She wrote back, I feel you. 10.54, that was the last uh, message. What would your mother think of what's happening in Gaza now? She would be mortified. Because you can't cure killed babies with more dead babies. We need peace. That was, that's what she was working for all her life. I don't want people to hear what I'm saying in Israel. I stand by my message, but my friends, how can you not want, you know, everybody to die? <laughs> pain is pain. And uh, I talk with people from the kibbutz and we cry together. It, you, you can't mend that. But the only way to have safety and to and to live good lives is is with peace. Vengeance isn't a strategy. Eleven forty one is the time. Vengeance isn't a strategy, which is why I think that that phrase about eradicating Hamas is close to a fig leaf. I wonder if anyone truly believes that. And if you don't truly believe it in your heart of hearts, then you are endorsing vengeance, limitless vengeance, I think, unless you can put a number on the deaths that you think are a price worth paying for the pursuit of the impossible. Well, and, and there it is. Or, 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 um, or you genuinely believe that it is possible. Great work there for, from Sikunda Kamani on, on, on Channel 4 News. Uh, let's go to Bromley. Ilara is there. Ilara, what would you like to say? Steer us back to Keir Starmer, if you can. <laughs> Hi, James. Um, thanks for having me on. Long time listener, first time caller. Gosh, so you pick your subjects. <laughs> well, it's one I feel really passionate about, so sure. of course I'm going to call in about this. Um, 
going back to the Keir Starmer situation, I definitely, I'm really let down by him. I okay. really thought he would have, you know, from the beginning, I would have thought he would have been on the side of humanity and calling for a ceasefire to begin with. So to see that until this day, he's still standing strong in his position is quite disappointing. And from my perspective, I think those MPs had a right to vote whichever way they felt. And yes. of course, it might not be conducive for them to continue in the Labour Party because obviously their ideologies are quite different at this point. Um, so for me, he definitely should have stood for a ceasefire, especially when you've got the IDC, the IDC are coming out, the oh, IDF, sorry. Oh, yeah, that's all right. They're, they're coming out with all these um, evidence from their raids saying that, you know, the our Shifa hospital has always been the, you know, the point where all the Hamas are, that's their headquarters. And the evidence they're coming out with is just ridiculous, Jane. If that's the evidence they're going by to justify why they keep attacking and the bombarding um, Gaza, it's just ridiculous now. It really is ridiculous. Uh, you, you, you're perfectly entitled to that view, just as people are, are entitled to another one. I, I'd quote another Channel 4 news journalist, actually Alex Thompson, who correctly states that Israel has yet to produce one shred of evidence to back its claim of a Hamas command and control centre under Al Shifa Hospital. But that doesn't mean it's not true. It's just impossible to independently verify it, partly because of the restrictions in place on foreign journalists moving into that area. And I would add that the World Health Organization has condemned Israel's decision to send troops into the hospital complex yesterday. But if if they were trying to find, genuinely trying to find a command centre, as, as they state, then they would have had no option. But they haven't mm. produced any evidence yet that they did actually find a command centre. So, so we'll keep a watching brief on that. What's the difference between mm. a ceasefire, a humanitarian ceasefire and a humanitarian pause to allow access for aid, food, water, utilities and medicine? None. <laughs> but that's what Starmer's called, called for. There's, there's no difference to me. But that's what Starmer's called for. He's called for the second thing. And you're cracking on at him for not calling for the first. No, uh, they need to have a ceasefire, not just a human. You know, when you put when you, it's like you, you said earlier, it's semantic. So when you say a humanitarian ceasefire, he might. We need a ceasefire, and people that keep talking about pro-Palestinian protesters yes. don't um, and not calling for Hamas to, to give back the. the I think um, I've dealt with that. I, I have dealt with that, but you, you cannot believe that if. A ceasefire is announced tomorrow by Israel. Mm -hmm. You cannot believe that it will be permanent. No, of course it there won't will be still, permanent. There will still probably be missiles coming out of the Gaza Strip by tea time. Yeah, it, but at the end so of the day... So it's a pause. So you're the one that's suffering from semantics, I think. Well, you can call it a pause if you want to, but it needs to be a very long pause. It needs to be a yeah, pause okay. enough for there to be enough aid to come through. And another thing that people need to understand is... Con you can continue bombing Gaza, but what you're not going to do, you're not going to kill the ideology. That's just going to spring up. Once these kids grow up, they're going to become even worse than their predecessors. So there needs to be a better way of dealing with Hamas apart from just bombing everything. But then all, all, all you're doing is postponing the inevitable, which is what you're accusing Keir Starmer of doing. It's just a bigger <laughs> pause. It's just a, it's a longer postponement under your reading of ceasefire than his reading of humanitarian pause. Yeah, well, you could it's say tricky, that, but it? then the only, it is tricky, but then the only other option is to kill every living soul in Gaza, which is, <laughs> it's just unacceptable. Well, and that's why the question of how many is too many, I think, needs, needs to be asked. It needs to be asked. I don't think you can let people avoid that question, or at least avoid being asked it. You can't, of course, force them to answer it. Um, I, 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 I think I... Misrep, mis, misspoke a little uh, a, a moment ago. Vivian Silver um, is is believed to have been killed now by Hamas, the Canadian-Israeli peace activist whose son we heard from just a moment ago speaking to Secunda Kamani on, on Channel 4 News has, has been declared dead after her remains were found at her home. Um, so it adds an even deeper poignancy to the words of her son and, and the memory of, of his mother. It's 11.47. James O'Brien on LBC. <laughs> James O'Brien on LBC. 10 to 12 is the time. I, I, I guess the dissonance or the holding two thoughts in your head at the same time involves saying, I wish Keir Starmer had followed Hamza Yusuf's lead, uh, the leader of the SNP, and called for a full ceasefire. But it's pointless. 
And I think Starmer gets to the place in his mind where he thinks, what's the point of doing something pointless? And I can see wisdom in both their positions. I can see honor in both their positions, which is mad because they're different positions. Unless you accept the full scale of the semantic point that a humanitarian ceasefire will almost certainly be temporary. So calling for a humanitarian pause simply involves disagreeing about how long the pause is going to be. Crikey. I don't think Starmer has got a particular problem on his hands here. It's a shame to see some of these people depart from his shadow ministerial team, but I suspect some of them will be back. And, and um, he's demonstrated quite an adult approach to dissent within the ranks. John's in Maidstone. John, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hello, yeah. I, I think actually Starmer's trying to offer an olive branch to Hamas in some ways. Mm. Um, it sounds a bit odd at first, but the point is, if you call for a ceasefire, both Hamas and Israel are going to bristle at that yes. in the same way that I bristled it at the vote yesterday. I was very angry with Sam yesterday. Right. But the more I think about it, the more I think, hang on a second. If you call for a humanitarian ceasefire, you are calling for something for the people of Palestine. Yes. And that requires two things. That requires Hamas to say, yeah, we want that. And it requires Israel, particularly Netanyahu, to recognize that the Palestinian people are not all Hamas. Yeah. Um, and that's something that both sides are not oh, really think... getting there at all, and we're not doing very well at. No. So I can see what um, Starmer is trying to do. When did the I penny drop? I like that. I like the idea. Separate the Hang on. Combatants. No, can you hear me? Just so if I can interrupt you. When did that penny drop? I love the yeah, idea. Yeah, I can hear you. He's still there. Yeah, I think there must be some weird delay on the line, actually. But I'll try once more. The When did the penny drop? Because I love the idea of you bristling yesterday when the vote was going ahead, but then having a little think about it and, and changing your mind. It'll never catch on, but I'm all for it. What, what was it? What made you reconsider? No. <laughs> well, I was dropped. I was driving back from France. I was just come across on the Channel Tunnel, oh, yeah. and um, I'd started listening to what you said. I started thinking, well, James has really put his head on the chopping block with this one. Um, I've had, and I initially was quite angry. And then right. one comment when you said, is there a difference between the two? And I thought, there has to be a difference. There has to be a reason why he's calling for a humanitarian break. Um, and yes. I, you know, and the same thing. The government's asking for the same ah, thing. Yeah, okay. So you, weird you had to work out so what he was doing. Why, in why order... would you do that? Yeah. This is because, yes, it has to be in my mind now that he has. He's looking for a lever that says we get a we get a pause, we get aid to the people of Palestine, we get the combatants to stop trying to kill each other for five minutes, and maybe we can work on that and get them to step away long term from their avowed aim of destroying each other. I like it. I, 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 there is a weird delay on the line. So I've, I had to stay quiet then, which is probably quite a good practice for me because it was in danger of turning into that two Ronnie sketch on Mastermind when, they, when he's given the answer to the question before. But thank you, John. Um, I didn't mean that. I didn't. I, when I said what made the penny drop, I wasn't expecting you to say listening to this programme. <laughs> Although obviously I'm delighted that that is part of the process of reconsidering but it was that notion of trying to work out why he's doing what he's doing because he clearly no one is going to accuse Keir Starmer of wanting more people to die in Gaza or in Israel and once you step away from that ludicrous position which there'll be some people holding it you step away from that ludicrous you try and work out the thinking behind his position and his determination yesterday to outline it to members of his party his parliamentary party who were planning uh, to, to vote with the SNP on that amendment, then, like John, you have to actually come up with something. You have to put something in that space. What does he actually want? Why is he adopting this position? Answer, because he knows that a full ceasefire is impossible at the current time. Therefore, you prioritise what is achievable. And if you can get humanitarian pauses in place, that is preferable to there being no humanitarian pauses in place. I think that's an incredibly strong analysis, actually, better than mine. So you look at, I, I did use the phrase, the art of the possible. Calling for a ceasefire is pointless, even though I would probably do it if I was in politics. Calling for a ceasefire is pointless. Why would I do it? Because of that question, how many deaths is too many, right? I can't answer it, therefore I can't condone the continuation of the carnage. But it's pointless. It's politically pointless. So what am I going to call for? Something that is possible. Something which makes my call have a point. 
what is that, right? Less, less bombardment, less carnage. How do you do that? Well, you pause it and you get more humanitarian aid in place, which means more people are going to survive. It sounds brutal and even perhaps cynical. It's not cynical, actually. It's the opposite of cynical. It's pragmatic as opposed to idealistic. So, in fact, and um, you've said this text, is, you're so pleased with this text, you've sent it three times. Starmer is a lawyer. He chooses his words carefully. Exactly. But he also analyzes words carefully. And the difference between a humanitarian pause and a humanitarian ceasefire is actually relevant here. It's more than mere semantics. It's only semantics if you're criticizing him for holding one position and not the other then you're picking up on semantics. What he is doing is calling for something that is plausible, feasible, achievable, as opposed to something that very, very sadly is not. And I would like the thing that's not possible to happen, and so would you. But as a political leader who wants to be taken seriously, not just domestically, but soon on the world stage, you've got to perhaps operate in the realms of the possible, not the impossible. I don't know, just a thought that John put into my mind. Emily is in Vienna. Emily, what would you like to say? Hi. Um, it, sorry, if there's a bit of noise, it's because I've got a nine-month-old on my hip, so apologies. That's all right. <clears throat> uh, so what, my, my concern is that this, is this a really the right hill for Keir Starmer to die on, mm. in terms of the vote? Pardon the expression, but... No, um, I understand. <laughs> this wasn't, this wasn't a, a proposal put forward by... Labour, this was SNP, what's the result of Keir Starmer's position is it's now elevated to the top of the news, and yesterday's news should have been dominated by the Conservatives being oh, it was. Uh, No, it was. I don't, I don't think that, that I mean, that some, well, I mean, looking at the front I, pages today... I'm not today. sure, actually. I, 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 last, last night, I only became aware of this when I looked at The Independent at, at 9.30, 10 o'clock, my time in Vienna, Yes, and it was the top of the news, and I... And because it had and just happened. Should... Because it had just happened, well, Emily. It's not, the, it's not... It wouldn't be top of the news if it was a digest of the day's news. Trust me. Had it had... Uh, but... No, you've got, you you got to the, trust the, me on the this. Negative... You've got to trust me, Emily. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it just, that's why it was there <laughs> at that time, on that, on that rolling news website. If you look at today's front pages, The Sun, fed up Rishi, no bloody Rwanda. Um, uh, we are a reasonable government. Uh, no, I know you don't, but I'm telling you what all the other newspapers are saying today, looking back on what happened yesterday. Uh, the Guardian PM vows to push through Rwanda plan after court rules it's unlawful. The Telegraph PM will use emergency law to start Rwanda flights. The Times, Sunak emergency law can save Rwanda policy. The second story on the front page of the Times, Starmer loses eight front benches in party revolt on Gaza. The reason why he had to do this instead of allowing a free vote is the what? labor the labor party has to have a policy on on this issue but did it did it, did it have did it have to remove the whip on, on and force people to make a decision yes it has to have a policy a you have to vote for the labor policy or, or or if you don't vote for it you can't retain a position in the shadow cabinet Does that happen with every single vote, though? I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely asking. I'm, I'm genuine. This isn't a, this, the, this the, isn't the, a the, the really big ones, where, where, the, where the whipping is, is, is three line, is serious, would always involve losing your ministerial office if you, if you wanted to vote against the three line whip. <laughs> yeah, see, she understands. <laughs> he, he understands. <laughs> Potentially, I, I, I just feel that it that it it didn't need it didn't need to have it didn't need to have this consequence. It did. the, he should have allowed a free vote. He can't allow I, a free I, vote because he has to have a policy and he has to stick to it and it has to be quite a strong policy. I, I do I do understand exactly what you're saying and I apologise if I'm being a little bit strident, but 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 it, but I'm I'm close to saying you you're just wrong <laughs> because he has to have. Uh, a, a strong position on this and if he has a, his party the leader of the opposition has to have a strong position on this issue and he does and if you're not agreeing with it you can't be part of the shadow cabinet that, that that's how it works you're not losing the whip you know you're still in the labor party still in the parliamentary labor party but you can't be in the shadow cabinet if you disagree with the party policy on this issue you just got collective cabinet responsibility i think emily actually probably most of us have forgotten what it looks like because you can be deputy chairman of the conservative party calling for the suspension of rule of law and rishi sunak's got your back it's 1201 james o'brien on lbc james o'brien on lbc oh gosh i forgot as well four minutes after 12 is the time and so did you 
I, I guess because the conversation we were having in the last hour was so serious uh, and, uh, and, and heavy duty, you forgot. Because for the first time I can remember in a long, long, long time, the switchboard still has two spaces on it at four minutes past 12 on a Thursday. Normally you start ringing in from about 10 to 12. Sometimes I allow myself to get a bit irritated by the fact that you're taking up phone lines that could be used by people still keen to contribute to the conversation that we're having in the hope of getting in early on Mystery Hour. So that is your call to arms. There is there's still one phone line free. What is Mystery Hour? Well, it's only your weekly opportunity to achieve the sort of satisfaction not ordinarily available anywhere else on your radio dial. And I'll give you a, another one, actually. I, 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 I will reintroduce the pledge that you will laugh out loud at least once between now and one o'clock. If you don't, I'll give you a full refund on the ticket price, okay? Uh, The best contribution of the week, my favourite contribution of the week, will win a Mystery Hour board game. Uh, Coming soon, hopefully, to a Christmas tree near you. If you are not lucky enough to win one, you can buy one. Oh, will wonders never cease? At mysteryhour.co.uk or in John Lewis and other shops. I think Argos soon, if not, if not, if it's not there already. But it's a brilliant game. Go and have a look at the Amazon reviews. And as with all my stuff on Amazon, including my books, do have a look at the one star reviews as well. Some people are confused about what gammon is when we use it as a as a description of a certain mindset of people. Yet some of the one star reviews for my books and indeed for my board game on uh, on Amazon, you can smell gammon as you read it you actually get a whiff of gammon up your nose sometimes you'll find yourself craving pineapple so strong is the whiff of gammon as you read um some of the ones well all of the one star reviews on my uh, uh, uh on my um books and board game over on amazon so mysteryhour.co.uk to, or amazon or whatever you want just just you know you know do yourself a favor uh, full terms and conditions for that competition because it is a kind of competition, even though it's just me giving away a board game to my favourite contributor to Mystery Hour, can be found at lbc.co.uk. Six minutes after 12 is the time. Shall we kick straight on and not bother explaining what it is? Shall we do that? I think we could do that. Uh, Anne's in Whitstable. And question or answer? Question. Carry on. I was a primary teacher for 30 years, for yes. my sins. That's a statement. Um, and anybody who's ever been involved in primary education will tell you that on a windy day the children are noisier they are wilder it's a lot harder to get them to concentrate and engage and i don't know why are you sure is this i mean i i I, the problem is this question has parameters that i i I have to establish independently i think well it's it's one of those if you ask any teacher, I mean, my great aunt, bless her, um, she was a teacher in the 50s and 60s, and I mentioned it in passing one day, and she said, well, yes, of course it is, like I was stupid. Really? It, 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 it is a well-known phenomenon. Uh, obviously, it depends on other things as well, but in general, if it's a windy day, the children are, and I still call them children, by the way, of I don't course. call them young people. No. Um, hey. it. it it's just well known. And right. I have, there windy must children. Be a reason, children on windy no days. Well, it, I mean, could it? They're just. Well, I have no idea. <laughs> Why must there be a reason? Well, I don't know. I suppose science. Science. <laughs> yeah. Well, as in, get, we get very strange phone calls, particularly <laughs> at night on LBC when there's a full moon. <laughs> well, maybe that's. It, it, it's just. All right, let's phrase the question another well, way. You don't have to. You don't have to. It's, it, I mean, the problem it, is, it, I, I can't. I can't have bunches. I can't have loads of primary school teachers ringing in to say that's nonsense. I've never heard so much rubbish in my life. I have to work <laughs> on the presumption that you and your great aunt are correct on this. Well, I think I'm correct. All right, that's good <laughs> enough is, for me. Okay. Is there an explanation? And if so, what is it? You're on. Is there an explanation? Is it even a thing? But don't ring in to answer the first bit. How would you even find... I mean, I don't know. Uh, so why do children... Uh, why are children at school misbehaving more on windy days? 0345 603. Stephen's in Leeds. Stephen, question or answer? Question, Jim. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I've started wearing a hat. And what sort oh. of hat? Oh, winter. It's like a Peaky Blinders style of hat. Very nice. About yes. six, different, six different styles. And what I've noticed since I've been wearing this hat is when, when I go up to someone and I say hello, I'll touch the peak of the hat yes. and give them, a, give them a slight nod or maybe even take the hat off, especially indoors. I'm just wondering where the etiquette comes from from that. Because I was thinking it could be maybe kind of a military-related Well, I, I, I think this has come up before. 
Right. And I think I know the answer to this. Go for it. I think it goes back to knights lifting their visors on their mm. armour to show that we were friends. You know, we're not having a fight. If, if, if we're going to have a joust, Stephen, I'm p- keeping my visor down, mate. You can be sure of that. But if we're going to go for a cup of mead together, I'm lifting my visor up. But it, why then? If, if that is the reason, why is there an ingrained human instinct to do it's that? Because it's gone back that? to that. So, so, so the lifting of the visor became a thing, and then when we stopped wearing armour, we carried on lifting the visor, even though there was no visor there. So we tipped our hat. We doffed our hat a bit. I'll, t- I'll take that. It's a, I I'll think it's that. a correct answer. Qualifications, it's come up before, and, 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 and we went definitive on it. I think it might even be in the board game, that one. Right, I'll take you on that. Thank I'll you, Stephen. Manchester next week. Top man, I'll see you there on the 28th. Looking forward to it. Cheers, mate. Take Ta- care. Bye. Take care of yourself. There you go. Round of applause for me, please, Keith. Come on, mate. Come on, mate. Uh, I like that one as well because it's a sort of one that you remember once, 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 well, as I just proved, once you know, you know. Uh, Chrissy's in Glasgow. Chrissy, question or answer? Hi, James. Um, well Hello. done on the new book. Thank question. you. Question. Yes. Uh, qu- question. Uh, it's annoying the hell out of me. <laughs> mm, what could it you be? Know, you know the gelatin capsules that you get for your washing, for your laundry, that you throw in, you, most of these things are like pods, Yeah, they call them, and you throw them in the machine and, you know, and they dissolve in water. Yeah. The fact that they dissolve in water, why don't they dissolve standalone because they're filled with liquid? What stops them from dissolving into a greasy You mean mess? why don't they dissolve from the inside? Yes. Yes, what is it about... Because I, I would expect if there was some kind of membrane that it would be water-soluble. Quite, I, that's so quite a good question. Because I was going to say there's, the, it's got an inner coating that stops it from dissolving, but then it wouldn't dissolve from the outside either, would it? Precisely. Precisely. So I... Well, I never. Um, yeah, there you go. Well, I never. Mm. I mean... It shows you the exciting, the exciting life of it. <laughs> well, I, no, I, well, everyone's wondering about this now. So you've, you've, spread, the, you've spread the mystery. The, I mean, the, the, would it be, a, be... The pH of what's inside it is going to be different from water, isn't it? The pH of the detergent is going to be different mm. from water. So it may be that. I mean, it must be that, actually. Yeah. I can't think of any other example. Well, well maybe not... Maybe not just that. I was thinking the composition of the chemicals within the liquid. Does that change? Yes, could it, do. You know, and the viscosity. Oh, I know, love the that word. Of the fl- I love <laughs> sorry, that word. the thickness of the fluid. No, the why are you saying sorry? We did a phone in two weeks ago about women saying sorry when they don't need to. I love the word viscosity. <laughs> don't change it. You're on. I, I like that a oh, lot. Right. Oh, I'm just being a bit viscous, obviously. <laughs> viscous. We're all a bit viscous sometimes. <laughs> Depends what you did um, last night. Yeah, but there's, there's no, no way for it. me as a housewife to, to, to check this. All I know is that if I've ever touched, gone in the bag with, with wet, wet hands, hands it gets gooey them. really quickly. Yeah. And they stick together. Yeah. It's a right old palaver, isn't it? Right, you're it on. Is. Why don't they dissolve? Why, does, why doesn't the liquid inside them dissolve the membrane around them? Mm-hmm. Yeah, 0345 6060973. Chrissy, do you want to know something funny? Go for it. Millions of people are agreeing with Anne about children misbehaving on windy days. Basically, every primary school teacher in the country seems to be listening today. They they just get all excited, I think. it's just. I'm not expecting uh, you to answer it. I'm just letting you have the news first. Breaking news, Chrissy. Yeah, I think it's an overstimulation thing. Could be an overstimulation thing. We'll find out. Uh, Speaking of overstimulation, a lot of people are trying to answer your question by referencing temperature. So it dissolves when it's hot, but that doesn't work at all because of the point you just made about your wet hands. 12.13 is the time. Ollie is in Watford. Ollie, question or answer? There's a question, please. Carry on, Ollie. So I'd like to say, when you read those one-star reviews... Yes. ...to provide that it's very much better than you could smell... It is indeed. A, a distinct whiff of gamma. It's not, quite not unpleasant, um, actually. Not unpleasant. Carry on, Ollie. No, absolutely lovely. Um, and we were at your show at Islington and it was great. So it was one of that. the maddest nights of my life, that, mate. It was so special. What we did you think? We stick around to get the... Um, the I, was, I, I think you, you and Stuart Lee should become the next Lauren and Hardy. Well, I think, I, well, I think I'd be the very junior partner in that comment. What did you think when Stuart um, walked onto the stage? Because I don't think people knew it was going to be him, did they? No, absolutely no idea. I mean, I because I, I listened back um, actually after the show, listened back to his full disclosure. Yes, where he sort of says no one knows me. Well, and, um, not true. 
That's what, and, 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 and you said not true, but he sort of is adamant that he yeah. gets in cabs and um, sort of there's, they, he says, oh, he's doing comedy and they say, oh, where? <laughs> oh, are you supporting or, or whatever? Um, which is amazing because he's, he's such a great, such the a gasp, great comedian. But... The gasp that went around the room because I was still backstage, I could hear it, let alone feel it. It was, just, it was, it was such a lovely moment for people to realise right, they were and, getting... and, and the cartoonist was an amazing touch Chris, well. Chris so Riddell, absolute when... legend. Absolute legend. It was such a uh, great When you got night. to some of the later, the later topics and then yes. I remember specifically around Elon Musk Yes, I know. I know. I've got all those. I've got all those drawings. I, I gave Stuart a few, but I've got almost <laughs> all of those drawings. And they're, they're such a treat. I'm going to get a bunch of them framed up. Anyway, we're making people who couldn't make it yes, to the sorry, gig yes, feel question. alienated. Question, is, question um, yes. Yes, is so when we have a leap year, why is the day added to February when it's to December? Well, because it's the shortest. already has an unusual... And I, and I know it's the shortest, but is that, is that the only reason why? Oh, okay, no, I don't know. Is there know. an actual reason why? I mean, why? why? It kind of feeds into, I don't, I don't have too many, I can't ask too many questions, but February is the shortest month. But when we have an extra day in the year because it's a leap year, why is it then added to the shortest month? No, what I like that. No, it's a good that. question. It can't. That can't be the answer, can it? Because it's the shortest month. Well, I mean, it might be, but it, it, it needs to be explained. You can't just say because it's the short. So April is the cruelest month, of course, and February is the shortest month. Thank you, Ollie, thank you for the kind words. It is 12.16. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 19 minutes after 12 is the time. Anne is categorically correct. I have been truly inundated with teachers, uh, by teachers attesting that on windy days, children misbehave. They are out of control. I was listening to James O'Brien's Mystery Hour about children getting excited on windy days, writes Patricia from Croydon. I taught in secondary school for 34 years and I dreaded gusty windy days as the children became particularly hyper, just like birds becoming frantic before a storm. So the caller was quite right. It is a well-known phenomenon in teaching. Well, there you go. Why? Why do children become, what's the, I'm going to use the word, particularly hyper? or wild on windy days. Uh, Why don't detergent capsules dissolve, given that they've got liquid on the inside? And why do we add a day to February, as opposed to any of the other months when it's a leap year? Richard's in Shrewsbury. Richard, question or answer? It's a question, please, James. Carry on. In English, we have um, a lot of collective nouns, particularly for animals, but also for other things, um, which are quite sort of descriptive or poetic or flowery. Yes. Do any other languages do that, or is it just us? Uh, what, what do you mean? So we have, we, rather than just having herd or flock or pack, Oh, I see. So you, mean, you mean lots of different like words. Of oh, sorry. Yes, of course, I understand. Uh, yeah. So, so no, 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 non-generic Collective yeah, nouns. Like specific ones. So, like one of the ones is "crash of rhinos," which I think is it, that's, you know, that's, that's one I really one. like. I'm one. sure it doesn't directly translate, but do other languages have like a, an equivalent? I'm or, just or, trying or to think. I don't, have, I don't have the Latin. I, I thought I might be able to come up with one of French. Oh, that's a lovely question. Yeah, I, I, I mean, all you need is one answer, isn't it, to be affirmative? Yeah. I don't think anyone can answer in the negative because you'd have to be familiar with every language on earth. That's true, and I, yeah, I think that's unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, of little I, faith. <laughs> I, I, I would love to hear if, you know, if, like, uh, the Welsh had uh, a collective noun for kangaroos, yeah. and, and yeah. why. <laughs> what is the collective noun for kangaroos? Uh, I, uh, no, I don't, I don't know. know either. But I bet there is one, though. Yeah, of course there would be. Well, uh, well, yeah, but that's in English, isn't it? Well, yeah. Albeit Australian. Uh, thank you. I, no, I like that one. So collective nouns in foreign languages. I, I, I wonder if there is. I, it's lovely. It comes from the Anglo-Saxon, then the Germans probably do. I don't know. It's on the list, Richard. Great question. Great question. Uh, Zara is in Kingston. Zara, question or answer? It's an answer. Carry on. Hopefully it's an answer. So it's about why children go wild on windy days. Oh, yes. Um, so I, um, I'm a child psychotherapist and part of my training I had to observe a two-year-old for a year in a nursery and I noticed exactly the same thing, that when it was windy, this room full of toddlers were absolutely bananas. Um, so at the time I Googled it and Google said that there was no science behind it. Um, so I had to think based on what I know about child development and their brains and everything and I think that they are much more um, 
susceptible to the environment. So kind of much in the same way that parents might try and have an argument, but without raising their voices, children yeah. can sense that, that tone and that, oh. that there's just a feeling. Or like, I know for me, I've got a four and a half year old. Whenever we're uh, packing to go on holiday, he loses his mind because he can just sense that there's some sense of kind of urgency. So there's a, there's a, there's a what do they call it? There's a disruption in the something. It's a dysregulation. So yeah. I think it's a primitive thing that when it's windy... It might be that some children seek comfort because that unstable atmosphere makes them feel a bit scared. And some children, it makes them dysregulated and they kind of reflect that chaotic atmosphere in their behaviour. So there's no sort of cause and effect explanation of it. Yeah, there's no, there's no there's, science, but know. there's kind of, when you look at child development and how their brains work and how they get dysregulated very easily, that it kind of makes sense. Qualifications? Child psychotherapist. So you've observed it then? I have. Yeah, I take that. I think that, that, that works. So it's a dysregulation in the atmosphere contributes to a dysregulation in the behaviour of the child. It's, it's yeah. Well, there we go. A yeah. round of applause for Zara. I like that one. Yeah, mate, I mean, it makes sense. People might add to it, Zara. They're welcome to do so, but you're... Uh, Round of applause is ring-fenced. Uh, and Esteban is next in Honour Oak Park. Esteban, question or answer? Question, please, James. Carry on. So I saw a video of um, kind of, you know, the guards who walk around, horse guards and so on, marching with their rifles. And uh, there was one child who uh, didn't notice them or didn't know that he had to get out of the way and he more or less got trampled over. Yes, so I've seen question. that clip. It's a viral clip, it. isn't it? It's quite... Yeah, it's a, yeah. I think he shouted. I think the soldier shouted, but the mum was too busy on her phone or something. I forget the details, but yes, I'm familiar. I mean, I mean even, even in that instance, I was wondering, like, are they tourists? Do they know the rules? Do you know they were meant yeah. to get out of the way on San English? But anyway, the question I was... Know, I didn't know could, that. Did you know that? <laughs> I didn't know that. I think only because I've seen previous videos of that being yeah. the case oh, and other enough. people being trampled over. Get out of the way! Get in the back of the bed. <laughs> Carry on. What's the question? <laughs> Maybe out of just sheer fear. Yeah, mm. it's like run. Um, could they be sued? Like, oh, and, and if they are sued, is it themselves? Because technically they're the king's guards, oh, aren't Lord they? Above, How does this that is work? a complicated question. I thought I, I just so I mean, so if if they trod on a on a human and did them some damage, yeah. Would the human have a case for damages? I presume so. Or, or, or you're yeah. wondering if there's some special dispensation because of that's it, the royal connection. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I, is that a good question or not, Esteban? I'm not sure, mate. I don't know. The missus agrees. She thought it was a good Did question. Did she like so it? I generally, so I generally told one. her that's a that's a good sign. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. It's two to one. Uh, all right, you're on. Um, so, it, 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 are they liable to normal laws when they're trampling small children? Um, uh, uh, in the course of duty, oh three four five six oh six seven nine seven three. I guess we just need a horse guard to answer that question, a former horse guard or something like that. But even you probably don't know. If it's probably never happened, nobody knows. Don't need to know. Nobody knows. Uh, I like it. Uh, Chris is in St. Helens. Chris, question or answer? Answer, please, James. Carry on. Uh, for the pods. Oh, yes. Uh, so, long story short, they can't it, they can't uh, dissolve with the product that's in them because they're super concentrated. I can't remember the name of the polymer, but it dissolves in a certain saturation of water. Yes. Um, and basically, because the liquid detergent is super concentrated, it's, it can't physically dissolve in that. And that's why when you add water or if... Say, for example, you've got steam in your kitchen, you might find that they're starting to dissolve before you even put them in the washing machine. Yes. So, so the, the, the concentrate, so they, they dissolve in water and there's not enough water in the, in the, in the concentrated liquid. Exactly that. So, is it PVA it's called? I don't know, to be honest, mate. Quali qualifications? I, 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 uh, I wrote the process guide to make the detergent for a very well known uh, brand. You wrote the process guide? Uh, I wrote the software to the, for the process. Um, I'm an automation engineer. You've been on before, haven't you? Yes. Did you get a, Did you get a Ray Liotta? Yes. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> I don't think you get another one on this. Do you? Do you get another one on this? Uh, I'm not possible. Because it's super cool. You wrote the software for the recipe for the for the for the, for the pods. For the detergent side, yes. For the detergent side. That's pretty good, isn't it? But then you're going to just hoover up all the Ray Liotas whenever there's a question about detergents. No, it's anything manufacturing, mate. <laughs> well, that was it. What was the other one? What was the last one? Was it about barcode? Uh, no, the what? 
PD puddings. Yeah. I just, do you think I'm going to let Keith decide? You literally wrote the book. So you get one. I'm Ray Liotta, and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. If you build it, they will come. Nice one, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Uh, okay. Thank you, mate. Nicely done. Um, soluble in water, but not soluble in detergent. It's polyvinyl alcohol, Jonathan tells us. Quite poignant now that Ray Liotta is no longer with us. That, And speaking of poignant, is anyone else just having their... Get, getting completely blindsided whenever I read about Matthew Perry? Absolutely. I, the, the tributes from his co-stars yesterday, um, I think they've all given one now, but the one that Lisa Kudrow, who played Phoebe, wrote was just it just they, they just get me it's the first time i mentioned this to you at the time it's it's it, him and george michael for some reason have just they just get me every time i i remember that they're that they're no longer with us it just it's just you never know how big a hole someone's going to leave i don't know them i didn't know either of them. i met them but i didn't know them they weren't but gosh that but matthew perry one just breaks me every time i see it uh 28 after 12 liz is in petswood liz question or answer um, it's a question, please, James. Yes. Um, so I woke up this morning, and for some reason, I was just thinking about this, and I thought, why have I never thought of this before? And I really want to know the answer. Um, so I thought, um, I'll phone James today. Yeah. And what it is, is when you buy sort of roast beef or raw steak or something like that, and you get it out of the bag, it's it's, it's really quite bloody, and you, you see quite a lot of blood there, and, you know, it hmm. reminds you of, the, of where it's come from. However, when you buy chicken... You don't see, you never see, even if you buy a whole roast chicken, you never see any blood. So I was wondering if chickens had blood inside their bodies. Well, of course they, they have blood inside their bodies. Oh, but why don't you, why do you never see it from raw chicken whenever you buy, where is it then? Well, where does it's it go? been drained out in the well, slaughtering process. And it, the same is true of red meat as well. It's not actually blood that you see. It's, it's, oh. it's myoglobin, I think is right. the word. Yeah, so the, so so I, I just don't understand how the well, how the meat is very white in chicken and it doesn't look like there's ever been any blood in it. Well, they, I mean no there bread. would have been, but I don't. Well, I don't know that bit. It's um, it comes out of the muscles. The so red would have been there would have been blood inside the white the whiteness the white chicken. I guess so. Raw. Yeah, there'd be there'd be. I mean, the, the capillaries are just empty, so the capillaries are there in the meat, but they're empty, so there's no redness. I think because so all the all the blood has been chicken. Yeah. There's a, so there's a there's a process in the factory where they just drain blood. Yeah, but, I mean they hang it upside down and all the blood comes out. No, oh, so that means then it must be smaller when I'm, all the. I'm moving out of my comfort zone now. I I I, <laughs> I, I I I presume they hang them upside down until all the blood comes out because gravity seems to be the best way of ensuring that all the blood comes out. But I do I know okay. that I don't know where the word myoglobin entered my vocabulary. Mm. But I know that when you are talking about uh, bloody meat, like rare meat, it's oh. not actually blood that you're talking about. It's 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 myoglobin. Hmm. Well, I'd still like to know where all the blood goes from chicken. Yeah, fair enough. Well, I mean, you know, if you think about a pig, hmm. you don't see much blood on you don't see much red on pork, do you? Either. A bit more than on chicken, though. Do you? More. It's just the chickens I thought, and I just wondered if, if they ever got a cut if they. I can't, so if I you want to know if you cut a chicken, would it bleed? Yes, as well, yes. Well, there's sometimes <laughs> blood in eggs, isn't there? Mm, well, yeah, try not to think about that. <laughs> well, there is, though. I mean, that, like when we had chickens, you would occasionally get a little bit of blood in it. It's not very pleasant. I do, I I do appreciate it. I thought that was the embryo. Mm, yeah, but it's still that. blood, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's, uh, I expect that it's what it's made from eventually. But. So I shall, I shall, it's on the list. Why, why, where does all the blood go? Because they make black pudding out of the pig's blood. That's why I mention it. You drain a pig mm. and then you make mm. lovely, delicious black pudding out of it. Yeah, yeah. It's just the chickens. Oh, I know, you keep, you're not being distracted from the chickens, are you? You're hitting me over the head with a chicken every 30 <laughs> seconds during this conversation. <laughs> where does all the chicken blood go? Yes. <laughs> well, we're on a subject. What do they do with it? Exactly. And, and uh, you know, well, how does it happen? How much blood could a chicken it? chuck if a chicken could chuck blood? How and much blood is there? In it. The factories must be swimming in and it. You'd think so. And, and, and you'd, oh, God. And then put it to, right, you're on. Yeah, where does all the chicken blood go? Uh, uh, and why does there appear, if you want to add to it, what's going on with a nice piece of beef? Can't believe you that that made me late for the news, honestly. Thomas Watts is here now with the headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. 
James O'Brien on LBC. 12.36 is the time. Questions that still need answers include... Uh, we've done that one, we've done that one. Why do we stick the extra day on the end of February in a leap year? Do other languages have collective nouns like we do, sort of quite imaginative ones, like a murder of crows or a crash of rhinoceri? And when those horse guards trample over children, are they legally liable in any way? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. And you can still put... Um, your own questions on the board as well. Quite a lot of people turning vegetarian during the uh, course of the last conversation. Uh, oh, that one as well. Eggs. What was it again? Do chickens and blood. Do, do, where does all the chicken blood go? Uh, sorry. I, 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 Matt's not happy. It's mad that you've watched Simon Amstel's Carnage. It's a brilliant film now. Yet you can't see that that last conversation was psychotic. Maybe I can see that it was psychotic, Matt, actually. So there. Uh, 12.37 is the time. And Mo is in Eastbourne. Mo, question or answer? Answer. Uh, the f February question. Yes, why do we uh, put the extra day on the end of February? Right, so our calendar is Gregorian. It's based on the Julian calendar, which was done by Julius Caesar. And in Roman times, initially they had 10 months. Yes. And the proof to that is today's name, September, comes from Septa in Latin, which is seven. Yes. So it was the seventh month. October uh, is eight. was the ninth. November October is nine 8, and, December and December is ten, is isn't it? 10th. That, exactly. Yeah, well done. So then they added January and um, February, and February was the last month to be added. So when they were doing the adjustments, oh. they added the days on the last month. There oh. you go. Okay. So well, the last month to be added, but did the Roman year end at the end of yes. February? Yeah, it used to start in March okay. and end in December, and then they added January and February, and February comes from a festival that was a festival of purification, so that was the purification transition month, which the year ends. So it made, so actually, Ollie's question was doubly good, because he, he, he thought it made more sense for the extra day to be stuck on the last month, and in fact it was. Yes, you, the gentleman was very clever. No, and like can it. I just say, I'm not going to answer another question like no, I always have to do. No, you're not. Uh, because you'll shoot me dead. Yeah, uh, too but right. the, the question about the chicken is the most first word question I've ever heard on this show. Uh, no, yes, I think I understand what you mean. I, I think if even I might... grew be, up anywhere else the, the, yeah, answer that question. Uh, uh, the uh, grandmother, well, they've seen the grandmother preparing chicken. Even a familiarity um, perhaps with some street markets in Singapore might have provided exactly. an answer to that question as well. But, yeah, I, but I think it's a valid question and like any of them and I, yep. I applaud it just because it demonstrates that we live in supermarkets these days a, a, a supermarket state I think we might describe Absolutely. it as well, uh, qualifications Mo for the for the Roman question um, we, we learned at school because I grew up in Egypt and we have a different calendar in Egypt officially like the Islamic calendar so we all learn a lot about different calendars and we also have the Coptic calendar and, yes. which is based on the Jewish calendar so I'm like officially three calendars in Egypt so it's part of like your high school love it. plus I love languages and etymology and stuff so that's why I remember December is the 10th one. Round of applause for Mo, please. <laughs> Lovely stuff. Thank, thank you very you. much. No, thank you very much. Philip is in Borehamwood. Philip, question or answer? Hello. Uh, question, please. Carry on. Um, so where I live in Borehamwood, there are two, well, nearby, there are two leisure centres, council leisure centres, two swimming pools, um, both different temperatures. One is a gala pool where they use for competitions and things like that. Yeah. And therefore, they've made it a colder pool, like really much colder. Yeah. And no one can tell me why it needs to be colder. It doesn't need to be, to be. a gala pool. Does it need to be? That's what they said. That, that, or that's their reason for it being colder. So, so there's one in Bushy, which is one temperature, and right. one in Borehamwood, which is colder. I might say the kids swimming, and they're very precious. Well, I, I, I think it might be obvious. Okay. Because, so if you're in the gala pool, you're, you're there for exercise. You're not just splashing about, are you? You're, you're, you're a serious swimmer. Right. If the water is warmer, the warmer the water is, the more likely you are, I would have thought, to sweat or to, or to cramp up. So if you're doing competitive training, like yeah. proper training, physical training, then, then the, the, the cooler water means you'll... You'll just do. Also, for record, you probably slow down in warmer water for those reasons, and therefore, for a record to be more likely or your fastest time, you want cooler water. It cools you down as you exercise. Whereas in the other pools, you're not really exercising; you're just splashing about, so you don't want to get cold. 
So they do have family swims and children swimming. It's not just, they don't just use it for galas. It's just that's the one that they do but use. But it's, it's a competitive pool is what we'd call it, right? Yeah. So I think that will be it. I'm going to leave it on the board and I'll let a swimmer okay. answer it, but I'll be very surprised if it's not linked to sweating. Okay, well, if it is, you're, you know, obviously welcomes your round of applause. Well, that's very kind of you, yeah. Philip. That's very <laughs> very kind of you to come round my house and tell me to help myself to a drink. That's, that's all right. <laughs> it's nice to turn on LBC and have a light-hearted uh, hour. <laughs> Top man. Thank you, mate. 12.42. Why are competitive pools colder than leisure pools? I think I've got the terminology correct. Um, uh, Richard. 12.42. Sean's in Worcester. I was in Worcester last week. Very nice. Yeah, it was, it was all right. I, I was looking for a pub. I couldn't find it. It must have sort of either gone shut down. Everything south of the station seems to have shut for, for a bit, and everything north of Fourgate Street was, was new. So loads of new bars and restaurants north of Fourgate Street or, or going up towards the cathedral, but then going away from the cathedral, lots of things seem to have shut down. Have you noticed that? Yeah, the river flooding's not been helping. No, that wouldn't help at all, would it? Anyway, question or answer? Um, question. Yes. Bit of a jovial one. So <laughs> I was joving around with my fiance the other evening. Oh yes. And I tried to stick my finger up her nose, messing around. I say, was this for was this foreplay or, or or was it just general sort of mischief? Worcestershire foreplay. Worcestershire goes back foreplay. To the 1800s. Like it, yes. <laughs> um, my finger would not fit up her nostrils. It made me think: Is everyone's finger diameter in proportion to their own nostrils? Great is there question. someone out there who can't pick their own nose? That's a superb question. So you, I, if if your girlfriend had your fingers she would not actually be able to pick her nose or she would she wouldn't get it back out she would it was that tight it was quite it, quite quite, yeah. a, quite a tight fit yeah whereas i've never in encountered there. anyone who's had prob but you wouldn't know would you it's not the sort of thing you'd volunteer on first meeting no but on this show maybe so you could and it's got nothing to do with height either has it because you know you, you know just the, pure girth james so pure girth girth width Depth, not depth even. Okay, so, so are our fingers... Is it accessory or is it just... Well, it won't just be finger there? to nose. There's probably a question here about general physiognomy proportionality. Because I imagine that you could probably fit your little toe up your nose, but not up your girlfriend's. Yeah, possibly. But I'd want to know if there's an answer to it. Uh, I will find, well, I will try. I will endeavour, Sean, <laughs> to find out for you. Is there is there a relationship between finger girth and nostril width i think we've used i think we've used those words correct i love that and uh, just before you go how did your girlfriend feel about this um she got me back quite 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 harder so yeah okay so she 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 rammed her finger up your nose no she slapped me (laughs) 12 44 is the time i got kicked in the head by a horse kay's in plymouth kay question or answer um an answer today james carry on kay um, the um, blood in steak but not in chicken. Yes. You're you're quite right. It's myoglobin. Yes. Um, myoglobin isn't actually anything related to, to blood. It's a protein found in muscle But this is pigment. the red stuff. This is the red this stuff. Is, this is the red stuff, yeah. yeah. Weird. So it's a muscle pigment. And in mammals, there is a much higher concentration of myoglobin than there is in fish or birds or even certain other mammals. Oh, right. Yeah, um, okay. So that's all and it so, is. That's all it is. When you when you cook it or cut it, the myoglobin is released. Um, and pigs, because they've got a different muscle structure that, that's less dense than cows, that's why it's more of a white meat. Um, and uh, there you go. Simple as that. And I, I was going to ask you the next bit of the question, but I think Tony and Kettering is going to do that. So I just need your qualifications for this bit of the question. My son is a relatively newly qualified biology teacher. And mm. every time we say we've got a really bloody steak, he gives us a lecture. Oh, <laughs> does he does he use a special voice? He does. He's got a teacher voice. He's, he's only been teaching for actually, just over half the term. <laughs> actually, I think you'll find that it's not blood at all, Mother. It Pretty is, much. I love yep. that. Uh, round of applause for Kay, please. <laughs> and then for the second part of the question, I think we go to Tony and Kettering, to, uh, who I'll come to after this. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is indeed. 12.49 is the time. I mean, I've got a couple of podcasts out today that I should tell you about. Uh, One is already out. That is the media podcast that this was an amazing thing to do, actually. I have to be honest with two 
genuine Fleet Street legends. Uh, Alan Rosbridger, former editor of The Guardian, and Lionel uh, Barber, former editor of the Financial Times. I, I talk about imposter syndrome, talk to, talking to those two titans of the industry about the new book um, for the Media Confidential podcast that Prospect put out every week was was just an honor in every imaginable way. Something that if you told me 10 years ago that was going to happen, I, I would simply not have believed you. Um, and also coming out later today, comes out about tea time, uh, I did the uh, Pod Save the UK with Nish and Coco, which is a lovely sort of uh, light-hearted roundup of the news. And goodness knows, we, we recorded it yesterday and there was plenty, plenty of, of news um, to talk about. In fact, it was still breaking while we were doing the record. So there's a couple of points in there where we sort of went back and, and, and did it again. So that's the Media Confidential podcast with Alan Rusbridger and Lionel Barber at Prospect and the Pod Save. The UK pod- podcast, which I, I think they'd have their own YouTube channel, don't they? And you, you can you can find it um, all over the all over the uh, all over the shop. That's with um, with 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 Nish and Coco. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for indulging me. And the, the unlikely event that 15, 16 hours a week of me isn't enough to sate your needs. Then um, uh, it, it, there's there's another sort of hour and a half or hour I guess if you add the two up together for you to enjoy um, 12.51 is the time Tony what do you mean first name terms alright then Nish Kumar and Coco Khan but if I, I'll call them Nish and Coco if I want to ridiculous uh, Tony is in Kettering back to the blood Tony there will be blood <laughs> hello James hello Tony um, be careful people well. are having their lunch mate I know. I listen to you every day when I'm walking my dog. I can't believe I find myself phoning you up. Well, here you are. You definitely I are. Ha- I, I just happen to know what blood is. Where all the uh, chicken like, blood goes. It's not a great phone line, so I'll be quiet and I'll let you speak. Okay. I mean, it's not a very pleasant thing to talk about, but basically, they are hung up, like you said. The blood drains out into well, on a stainless steel bench with a gutter at the back. All the gutters lo- join up run it right to the end of the plant, and at the end of the plant, there's a tanker part, like a petrol tanker-sized fuel tanker. Yeah. And it all just runs into that tanker, and as soon as it's getting near full up, they back onto it, drive it away, put in an empty tanker, and they run for 24 hours. The blood never stops flowing. Where does it go? They take it away to uh, different plants, but it's mostly made into, like, fertilizer you know like dried uh, blood that you put on yeah, plants of course stuff like it that. Is. yeah there it is but you can never have that tanker not available because the blood just runs 24 hours a day 365 days a year qualifications uh well i used to service the trailers that did the blood and woe betide oh. me if i couldn't have it ready to go and collect it oh i bet yeah i bet <laughs> um that'll do round of applause for tony lovely answer perfect answer you made it I can't believe I got a round of applause on your show. I just love the show, mate. It's all Thanks yours. You can much. keep it as well, Tony. You, can, you, don't, you don't have to bring it back next week. All right, mate. Look after yourself. Thank you, Tony. I like that. And, and um, Mo's point, if you didn't understand it, was that if you were to buy a chicken in a market elsewhere in the world, or, or, or indeed if you were familiar with agriculture, then the, there would be very little mystery about where, where chicken blood, where the chickens have blood or where blood goes. Uh, Ian's in Tenterden. Question or answer, Ian? Answer. Carry on. Right. Um, swimming pools. Why yes. you've got competitive swimming pools, different temperature to uh, leisure pools. Um, mainly because of the fact that, believe it or not, athletes sweat when they're swimming. Yeah. So it, the hotter the temperature, the more they sweat. They, if they sweat too much, obviously they don't actually uh, work properly in terms of their biomechanics, etc., etc., yeah. and they're not as fast, so yeah. they actually have it cooler for there. And there's also the fact that most of the really competitive pools like the London Aquatic Centre and things like that have got a much larger volume of water, which is easier to keep cooler than a smaller pool when right. you've got easy going on it. Yeah, and also it costs money as well, so it's not as if there'd be any impetus upon the pool people to, to, to warm it up unless they absolutely had to. 
well, years ago, uh, the, the pool that we swim at, uh, the swimming club that I'm associated with, yes. um, they put the temperature up in the winter for the old ladies' session one morning, and as they turned, tried to turn the temperature down, the handle snapped. <gasps> temperature got stuck, got hotter and hotter and hotter, <laughs> and we went in for a training session afterwards, and after about 10 minutes, the kids were all like lobsters, bright red the, and so on and so forth. And the harder they work, the, the, yeah, the less the suboptimal, the more suboptimal that would be. Qualifications, please, Ian. Uh, I'm a British swimming referee. I've got four daughters that swung competitively up to national level. Um, one of them went on to compete um, internationally as a lifesaver. That'll do nicely, mate. Nice big round of applause for Ian. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. No, I'm not quite Rayleigh Ota territory I, I, because there's no specific link to the question, just the general area of the question. So I, I don't know, maybe people think that's strict, but I'm in charge. Phil's in Inverness. Phil, question or answer? Hi, James. Very quick answer. Carry on. Uh, the troops before they mount King's Guard are given a specific set of orders. Yeah. Um, so as long as they follow those orders, they're following a lawful order and therefore do the job. And until the late 80s, uh, defence had the crown immunity and was therefore exempt from um, civil action. No longer the case. So individuals could raise a case against defence, but they'd have to prove that, for example, the soldier shouting make way for the King's Guard, uh, all the boots stamping on the cobblestones, all the signs, etc., were not sufficient to warn them of the risks. Okay, so if, if you if you if you stamped on a child without shouting, you could get into some trouble, but not anymore. Up until the late eighties, it has been changed, has it? It was or, the other way around. So the other way around. So now you would, but the health and safety regulation exemption expired in the late eighties or disappeared in the late eighties. So if an, if an individual didn't follow the set of orders, did something unlawful, then that individual would be responsible. If they've done their job as they've been taught and as they've been trained and following all the rules, then it'd be very hard to prove that that individual had done something unlawful. Qual- qualifications? So I'm major in the army and I have to write health and safety risk assessments. Ah, there you go. Right, well, that's pretty perfect. Round of applause for Phil, please. 1256. So are there any collective nouns in foreign languages and is there a relationship between the size of your finger, the width of your finger, the girth of your finger and the width of your nostril? Because Sean couldn't fit his finger up his girlfriend's nostril last night. Ben's in Clacton. Ben, question or answer? Um, answer, James. Ca- carry on. Right, so, um, yeah, I, my fingers don't fit up my nose. Um, I haven't been able to pick my nose since I was a kid. And I genuinely thought I'd be answering a more um, highbrow question this one day, but there you go. This, this, I'm bringing up a, about picking noses. <laughs> th- th- that is extraordinary. What sort of age were you when you realised you couldn't fit your finger up your nose anymore? I, I, do you know what? Uh, I, don't, I don't really... I just remember a kid. I, I have no idea when it happened. As I, as I got maybe 18, I don't know. I don't, who knows? Oh, what an but absolutely I've, legendary mystery hour moment this is, Ben. <laughs> I, th- pro- I probably keep pseudo fed in business. This is a thing. So you've got a particularly narrow nostrils rather than particularly I've, I've, fat fingers. I don't think I've got shovel hands, but you know, no. I've got. I've definitely got a smaller no- nose than than I need. I, I, so I, so I, I mean, there it is. Your fingers do not fit up your nose. Who'd have thought? There you go. Well, I'll tell you what, Ben. It's got you one of these. I'm Ray Liotta, you right? and you're listening to James oh, O'Brien joking. on LBC. <laughs> it's your building. Excellent. <laughs> oh my god that, that's it love it thank you James <laughs> <laughs> cheers Ben take care <laughs> Toby's in Salzburg our second call from Austria today none of it counts I don't get any money for this Toby you know you don't, get, you don't fill in right. anyway question or answer quickly you don't get money but you get an answer from me James Indeed. And it's about collective nouns oh yes uh, as you sometimes point out, there must be a German word for it. Yes. yes. And so uh, <laughs> the answer to the question is yes. Uh, in German, it's also it's quite common to have different collective nouns for troops of animals. For example, you have a sprung of deer. Huh? You've, you've got a rotte of wild boars, whilst you have a herde of sheep. Yes. You've What's a rotte? What does, of fish. what does rotte translate as? You call me what a group of wild boars, or what it's called. It's got no other meaning. A rote is always a, oh, okay. a troop of wild boar. Like a troop or a, or a group. So, so lots of different words for herd. But yes. do any of them have another meaning? Like we would say a murder of crows, and obviously murder has two meanings. Do you have any like that? Yeah, you have a schule of fish, so like a school of fish. Oh, a school of fish, yeah. that's a, yeah. Oh, great, right, perfect answer. Qualifications, German. Round of applause for Toby. Exactly, yeah. No, great work. I wonder, did we tip them all off? Have we tipped them all off? That, that, oh, we didn't. Well, no, I did the hats off one. 
I did the, what do you mean, oh, well done? I invented Mystery Hour. I'm allowed to answer that. I did the visors. Um, I, I, it, who do we give the game to? Do we give it to... I gave Sean... Short, Sean asked nostrils. the question, didn't he? It's got to be Nostrils Man. And Ben answered it. So the person who asked it or the person who answered it, though? Answered it. Are you sure He's you didn't hear enough. the person asking it? He suffered enough, the man with the small nostrils. Well, Sheila has spoken. It's going to Ben, so not to Sean. Sean's going to be gutted. He's going to be so cross, he'll probably try to stick his finger up his girlfriend's nose again. That's it from me for another day. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back to the whole show podcast on Global Player, the official LBC app, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. All of LBC's shows are there to catch up on, as well as the world's biggest podcasts, including Mystery Hour, like a self-contained Mystery Hour. A lot of people don't realise that. I still get messages from people who've just discovered it. Pause and rewind live radio on Global Player, where you're always in control. Download it for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Tom Sorbrick will be with you at four on LBC, but now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. James O'Brien on LBC. 